afternoon. All of you would have had a nice sumptuous lunch. And now, now we are moving to the next lecture by Professor Dr. Jairaja on case studies in canine cardiology. Dr. Professor Jairaja, I think many of you know, probably some of the youngsters may not be knowing. He is a professor of clinical medicine in Madras Veterinary College and his interests are in mostly in cardiology and uh, ultrasound and internal medicine also. And definitely you will have a good time here for the next 45 minutes. I request Dr. Jai Raja. Good afternoon, one and all. Am I audible? My voice is clear. Everyone at the back, can you hear me? Fine. So after a good lunch, I'm meeting you. I hope I should keep you awake. That's the only thing I have to do here. OK. I won't starve you. You eat like anything and Get, uh, get fattier like me. OK. <laughs> that is a punishment. <laughs> OK, fine. So assume you should know some basics of cardiology to understand this lecture, some basics, little basics. Without that, it's difficult to understand. I'll try to touch the basics, but within 45 minutes, I cannot cover the everything. So I'll start with case studies. OK. Everybody is OK, awake? OK, this is Bruno, a Labrador, around eight years of age, male. Um, he, the owner complaint is exercise intolerance. And uh, dyspnea at rest. What do you mean by dyspnea at rest? So normally, if it is going for an exercise, it can be dyspneic, but not dyspneic at rest. That means there is some compromise in the cardiovascular system. And it had a distended abdomen, and it had a tachyarrhythmia. So what are the normal rhythm in the heart? One is normal sinus rhythm. So you hear this lubbed up, lubbed up, lubbed up, right? Then what is sinus arrhythmia? Some passes will be there, no? Lubbed up, lubbed up, lubbed up, lubbed up. Lubbed up like that, you have that passes, no? If you auscultate that sinus arrhythmia, it means it's a normal heart because the vagus is dominating there. If at all there is a heart failure, then you will have a sympathetic domination. So you will not have that sinus arrhythmia. Instead, you will have a sinus tachycardia. And what this means, tachyarrhythmia means, it is tachycardic as well as arrhythmic. Any tachyarrhythmia you can name, Anybody, any tachyarrhythmia you can name? Supraventricular tachycardia. Then, anything very common I'm asking? Atrial fibrillation. OK. Then it had a, on auscultation, it had a moist crackles. How will you auscultate it? Where you will auscultate? I'm not going to tell you the area. How the sound will appear? Any example you can give, like you have that Velcro, no? When you do that Velcro, you hear some sound, no? That is how you hear. Um, and uh, when you hear a moist crackle, that means some exudation is there in the alveoli. It can be an inflammatory exudation or a simple fluid there because of pulmonary edema. 
Okay. I hope you all know this, what it should be. Okay. That's the ECG of that patient. So what do you think what it is? So what do you find here? Oh, how? Anyone? We'll have an interactive session, then only you won't sleep, please. Absence of P wave, right? Uh, only that, it, or it is tachycardic. What, what will be the heart rate? Heart rate is around 220. That you know, should know how to count it, which is around 220. What, do, what, do you, what is the normal heart rate you expect in a Labrador? Up to 120, it's fine. Okay, normally. So it is 220, you can imagine. It is quite tachycardic. And uh, is it the intervals are uh, regular or irregular? Okay. So here, you have absence of P wave. The P waves are replaced by fine undulations. That is called F waves. You cannot see that. So it, you, you think it, there is an absence of P wave. What it means is, the atrium will be contracting some 400 times. The ventricles are contracting some 200 times. So ventricles, atriums are not actually contracting, it is fibrillating. This is fibrillation. So normally toy breeds won't have this type of fibrillation because it doesn't have enough atrial mass. Whereas medium size to large size breeds, giant breeds, has enough atrial mass to have this arrhythmia. That's why atrial fibrillation is more common with Labrador's Great Danes. Okay. So absence of P waves and irregular RR interval, it's a hallmark of atrial fibrillation. So it is a atrial fibrillation. Okay. You have an X-ray in front of you. So what do you see there? Is lungs clear? Some type of opacity is there, right? I'll keep the cursor. You tell me what it is. That's the pulmonary vein and that's the pulmonary artery. That's a bronchi. So you see the congestion there. So it has a pulmonary congestion and pulmonary edema. Um, maybe it's not an exact alveolar pattern, but somewhere something like interstitial edema is there. See? Apart from that, do you find anything in this X-ray? Apart from... Okay, some little elevation of trachea. Maybe if you work out the VHS, it will have it. Other than the thoracic structures, anything there? Another, other than thoracic structures, you find any abnormality, I'm asking. Hmm? I'll mark it. What is this? What do you call that? Spondylosis deformance, okay? It's an incidental finding. It doesn't have any... Okay, this is the hematology of the same patient. Any abnormality you find here? Nothing much normal. Okay. This is the biochemistry. Any abnormality here? Somebody said something, please. ALT is elevated, eh? You think ALT is elevated? What is the higher range for ALT? 100, no? So to say ALT is elevated, at, should, at least uh, it should be three times elevated. This is because of induction, it is not because of hepatocellular injury. Okay. A marginal elevation doesn't mean anything. What about ALP? What is the higher limit for ALP? Around 250 in that range. So ALP is a very non-specific enzyme, no? So it is not very specific to liver cholestasis. So it should be at least six times elevated to say it is elevated because of cholestasis. Apart, don't bother about ALT and ALP. Something serious there. What is there? Blood urea and creatinine is elevated. Creatinine is around 1.6. Okay, otherwise it's all normal. Okay. I'll run the echocardiography here. So you see the 
dilated left atrium. This is left atrium. Okay, that's the right atrium, left ventricle, right ventricle, and the interventricular septum is like doom. This is another view of it. Do you see the fibrillation here? Do you see the fibrillation in the atrium? Atrium is not contracting properly. It is like shivering, no? It is like trembling. Huh? What is wrong there? Regurgitation in which valve? It's tricuspid. Because the left side is dominant one. It's a tricuspid regurgitation. If, okay. And this is the mitral regurgitation of the same patient. Okay. It has a mitral regurgitation as well as tricuspid regurgitation. Plus, all chambers are dilated. You can see that. And this is the MO finding of it. You have, you, can, can you all see this, no? So the dilatation of uh, ventricle is around 7.2 centimeter. In diastole and systole, it's 6.4 centimeter. The ejection fraction reached 23.64%, and fractional shortening reached 11.25%. What do you think? Does the heart have normal contractility or it's hypokinetic? It's hypokinetic. Because the normal ejection fraction should be above 50. And the fraction shortening should be at least 25. 25 to 45 is the normal range. So the contractility is poor and it's dilated. And the iota and left atrium, left atrium is so much dilated, it's almost three to four times the size of the iota. Normally it should be of the same size. It is so much dilated. And this is called EPSS, endpoint septal separation. Um, the filling of atrium into ventricle happens in two phases. The first phase is the passive filling, where the, when the left atrial pressure increases, the mitral valves will open up. That's the maximum excursion of the mitral valve. Then closes. Then the atrium contracts and fills the ventricle again. The passive filling fills the ventricle. 70% of the ventricle gets filled by passive filling. Remaining 30% gets filled by atrial contraction. So that maximal excursion of mitral valve happens with the passive filling. That is the distance between the interventricular septum and the, the wall excursion, so valve excursion. So that distance will increase when there is a dilatation. That is what the EPSS is. Normally, it should be below 0.5 or below 1. This reads around 2.17 centimeter. So that is the velocity of the mitral valve. Uh, and this is the TDI. Okay. One interesting I'll tell you. See, mitral valve here, the, you have two velocities, as I said, in the mitral valve. One is E velocity, other one is A velocity. Because the blood movement from atrium to ventricle happens in two phases. The passive filling is the E velocity, which is a tall peak. And the atrial contraction is the one short one. You see two peaks here. No? One is one tall one and small one. So here, the E velocity is quite high and the A is so small. That means it is having some degree of diastolic failure. It's quite deliberate. Okay. And this is to assess again the diastolic failure. So I hope this, is, this animal is having some degree of diastolic failure. That is how you have to understand by this. Okay, these are the echocardiogram findings. So dilated left atrium, left ventricle, right ventricle, right atrium. You have the mitral regurgitation as well as tricuspid regurgitation. You have increased LA-AO ratio. You have increased AP EPSS. And these parameters indicate that there is a diastolic failure, the other two parameters. So what is your diagnosis? Everybody knows it. Eh? What it is? Dilated cardiomyopathy with severe systolic dysfunction and moderate diastolic and moderate pulmonary hypertension. You have atrial fibrillation also. You have to address that. Any, anything other than this it had? It is a DCM. It has an arrhythmia also. Anything to add here? 
after going through the results of that patient. It had a pre-renal acetemia. That also should be considered. Because when you're choosing a drug, you have to be very careful in that. Okay. So straight away, it's all straight. What drug you will start with? It needs an inodilator, pimobendum. That's a dosing. That's 0.25 milligram per kg. Then the AC inhibitors I've chosen here is benzeprel. Why? Since it is having some degree of renal acetemia, I've not gone for enalapril because enalapril gets excreted, 90% of enalapril gets excreted through kidneys, whereas benzeprel is 50%. One milligram, normally you should use two milligram, but why I've done with one milligram is because already it is having acetemia. Acetemia can be a pre-renal acetemia or a primary renal acetemia. We don't know that still. Why this I've added? That is an antiarrhythmic agent you have to add when there is an atrial fibrillation. It's at the dose rate of around, you can reach up to 1.5 milligram, even 2 milligram. Okay. What is that, del TSM? It's a calcium cyanide blocker. It's a class 4 antiarrhythmic drug. Uh, there are two calcium cyanide blockers, you know. One is del TSM, other one is amylodipine, right? Why you are not using amylodipine here? Amylodipine is more specific for vasculatures, but diltiasm acts on the cardiac. So, the best antiarrhythmic agent here will be diltiasm. It blocks the slow sodium channels. Fast sodium channels is your lidocaine. It's a class 1 B group of drug. Okay. And then I'm adding digoxin. Why? It used to have a rate control. If you don't add digoxin, you won't have a, Only if you are persisting with diltiasm, you will not get the rate control. If you add digoxin, you will get the rate control very quickly. You can bring down the heart rate below 140, 120. That is very important. Okay. Any other thing to add here? Support is very important because it's a Labrador. It's mostly inherited. Sometimes I see Labradors recovering after one out of two years of treatment. I think the support is have a greater role there. Okay. Okay, that is about, uh, we'll go to the next case. <laughs> Sit with <laughs> You are running <laughs> for that? Differential for that? Bronchitis called. So chronic bronchitis can also have that. Why there is coughing here? That will go as I see. It has inhabitants and it had a grade 5 systolic murmur. So what is systolic murmur? When you hear a murmur during systole, it is systolic murmur. That is during lub. When you hear a murmur during diastole, it is a diastolic murmur. So 95% of the murmurs you hear will be a systolic murmur. You won't make any mistakes. So here it is a grade 5 systolic. Grading is based on how intensely you hear the sound. That's all. And it's a grade 5 systolic murmur. I heard at the left hemithorax. Okay. So paroxysmal dry coughing, abdominal distension. And it also had a tachyarrhythmia. And it is a grade 5 pan-systolic murmur heard over the left and it had a palpable fluid thrill also. So what does this X-ray shows? Generally, in a cardiac patient, I don't go for a ventrodosil. I just stick on to the lateral. Because since we have echocardiography, I don't go for a VD. Huh? So what is that arrow I marked there? That's a left atrial dilatation. So left atrium is dilated, and it is impinging on the left brainstem bronchi. So that is the reason for cough, cardiac cough. Not because of edema. It is because of the impingement of the... See, generally you see in a VD, 
the, the bronch it divides into two, no, the rear the carina. In between that only left atrium is seated. So when left atrium enlarges, it impinges on the left mainstream bronchi and induces the cough. Okay. Anything in ECG? Is again an absence of P wave and irregular RR interval. What is the, your uh, diagnosis? Absence of P wave means P waves are replaced by F waves, which is not visible to you. Irregular RR interval, it's a hallmark of atrial fibrillation. This is the most commonest arrhythmia in veterinary patients. If you know how to treat it, the best drug of choice will be your combination of DIL TSM and digoxin. Okay. Hematology? Anything wrong there? Hemoglobin? Okay, very marginally it's low, but doesn't matter. Then, which is really low? Only platelets? Leukocytes also. It's leukopenic. So what do you think? What disease you will suspect when you see this hematology picture? Who said Babesia? Erlesia, okay, okay. So Erlesia. So this is a classical picture of Erlesia. So, um, so more possibility for Erlesia, not Babesia. Generally, don't involve much on platelets and not much on the WBC. Okay. So Erlesia is also a concurrent infection here, probably. And here, anything wrong? No, almost everything is in the normal range. So this is the echocardiography of that patient. So what do you observe here? Do you see a left atrial dilatation? Yes, the left atrium is dilated. Other than that, don't bother about those mild pericardial effusions. You tell about the valves, how the mitral valve, anterior leaflet and posterior leaflet looks like. One thing, and you see it is like a drumstick, no, the tip, it is not thin, so something is there. So that is a thing, there is some degenerative changes happening in the valve. Okay. And also, the cooptation is not good. Okay, you can see that. What do you see here? Regurgitation, both mitral and tricuspid. Is it something wrong with the tricuspid valve? Or uh, maybe only with the mitral valve? Why then tricuspid is regurgitating? So earlier in DCM also you saw regurgitation, no? Both in mitral and tricuspid. Why it is happening? In dilated cardiomyopathy, nothing wrong with the valves, but still it's leaking. Why? Because the distortion of the mitral annulus, you understand? Because the chambers have grown big, it, the valves are not fitting there. Here, the problem is with the valves, that's why it's leaking. But why the tricuspid is leaking? It is because of pulmonary hypertension. When you have a pulmonary hypertension, you will have a tricuspid regurgitation. So based on the degree of tricuspid regurgitation, we can classify it as mild, moderate, severe. Because you cannot every time do a catheterization and measure the uh, pressure in the pulmonary artery. Okay. That is the M mode of it. Is the contract leading good or poor? You tell me, looking at it. You saw the earlier picture. Now you tell me the contract leading is good or poor. Does it look normal or not? The contractility it looks normal or not. You concentrate here. It's visible now for all of you. You concentrate in this area. Is the contractility good or not? Good, no? Okay. There is a clear left atrial dilatation. The huge left. This is iota and this is left atrium. And look at it now, you tell me what is wrong here. It's regurgitating. 
you don't have much uh, ventricular dilatation. Marginally, it's there. What about the ejection fraction? Do you read there? 72%. What is the fraction shortening? It's 40%. I said normal is between 25 to 45. And the fraction shortening is? It's normal, no? The contractility is normal. It's preserved. The systolic function is preserved here. Am I right? How come uh, there is a congestion? How come there is ascites? Okay, the reason I'll tell you. So uh, don't look at it. You will get confused about it because I have to do that. That's why I've done that. See here, the normally the left ventricle will be pumping against the systemic blood pressure, right? Because it is pumping into iota. Am I right? But during regurgitation, what happens? The left ventricle is pumping into, partly pumping into left atrium also. It doesn't know that. The heart muscle doesn't know that. It thinks it is pumping into the iota. But partly the blood leaks into left atrium, which is a very, very low pressure zone. You know that? Iota is a very high pressure zone. It should put a lot of effort to pump through iota. But without, the heart muscle doesn't know that it's leaking. But partly it leaks into left atrium, which is a low pressure zone. You understand? But the effort from the heart is the same. So that makes the heart muscles very hyperkinetic. You understand? That makes the heart muscle very hyperkinetic. So those patients with a mitral valve disease without a heart failure will have an FS of around 65 and above. As the heart failure sets in, the FS will come to 50 to 60 range. That is called mild, then around 45 in that moderate. And it comes, drops below 40 and below it is severe. So FS of, FS you are seeing normally, this range is considered as a severe systolic dysfunction. Okay. That is one way based on the FS you can determine whether this mitral valve, a patient with mitral disease having a heart failure or not. Or there is another way you can cube the left uh, ventricular dimension in systole and divide by the body surface area. So I'm not going into the details. So it's a mitral valve disease with severe systolic dysfunction. And it may be early issues on the cords. So your approach will be almost the same. You will start using pimobendin. You will start using furosemide, enalapril malate, diltiasm, digoxin. So along with that, you will use doxycycline plus tick control. OK. So this is a three months old Labrador puppy, reported to have an abdominal distension and then anorexia. You can see the distension. And there is a grade 5 holosystolic membrane, right hemithorax. And a palpable fluid in the abdomen, that means it has ascites also. So what do you think about the CCG? You have a very tall P wave. Very tall P wave. The height of the P wave belongs to the right atrium. Width belongs to the left atrium. So we have a very tall P wave. And you have a deep S wave. Again, it is for the right ventricle. So that shows that it's having some degree of not a severe right atrial and right ventricle enlargement based on this. What is this? So you have a, a bigger a globoid heart and see the sternal contact. It is quite high. The sternal contact is so high and you have a tracheal elevation also. So what do you suspect? Pleurisia. I'm talking on cardiology. So you think it's a pericardial effusion most of the time. But this is how a, a tricuspid uh, disease will appear. You see the reverse D. It's, it's an indication the right heart is enlarged. You have increased tunnel contact, and you have a reverse D appearance Okay, in the VD. Reverse D, I mean to say. So that's the echocardiography of the patient. You have a dilated right atrium. 
severely dilated right atrium, right ventricle, and the valves are not properly formed, the tricuspid valves. Sorry. Okay. Same same patient. It's so not the same patient, same condition, but it's in a different breed. That is around three months old, no? Just to make it clear much more clear. You see this, how the valves are malformed. The two leaflets, one leaflet is quite longer. The other one, you see, watch here. This leaflet is quite longer, the other one is very short, and it is a congenital defect. Uh, it can be expressed by three months, or it, sometimes it will be expressed even by 12 years of age. It may not get expressed easily, okay. So, this is the regurgitation you see. A severe tricuspid regurgitation. So diagnosis is a tricuspid uh, dysplasia. It's a congenital defect. It's very, very common with Labradors. So that is the most commonly seen congenital heart defects in our uh, Chennai and surrounding area, and with right heart failure. Okay. So of course, the management remains the same. Doesn't have much change. In his systolic failure, you have the same pattern of management. So diuretics, AC inhibitors, cardiac supportives, and pyomomentum. How much time I have, sir? Four, I can tell. So, I'll can, two more cases I'll tell. So, this is a patient, uh, it's a gold retriever, female, six years of age, with some swelling in the jaw and some vomiting was there. That's how it was brought. And they were treating for that uh, swelling there. But later, when I did a physical examination, you can see the swelling here. Okay. That almost in this area, the jowl area, they say. And when I did a physical examination, temperature was marginally elevated, but the heart rate was around 220 in that range. Feeding habits was a little reduced, and there was vomiting also, and there was a swelling in the intermandible area and the cranial aspect of the right shoulder. That's like an edematous swelling, non-painful. And the hematology showed Mild leukocytosis, other than that, it was okay. And uh, everything looks almost normal. You can read that. Except for mild, of course, uh, below 3.4 is considered low for potassium, it is 3.7. That's it. Do you find any abnormality in the x ray? Since it had a swelling there, they took an X-ray. This is before I intervened. It all happened. Any anything wrong here? It's a normal X-ray. Okay. Neck also they took nothing serious about it. An ECG I took because it was arrhythmic, so I took an ECG. What is this? This is a, basically it's a VPC, VPC of right ventricle origin. But it is continuous. When you see three or more VPCs continuously, we call it as VT, ventricular tachycardia. Okay, that's a very, very serious arrhythmia. The first I said, first common arrhythmia is atrial fibrillation. Then comes your VPC. VPC means here and there, one or two. This is a VPC of left ventricle origin. VPC of right ventricular origin will go above the baseline. Okay, you understand that. And uh, this is a severe case of VT. So it was a ventricular tachycardia. So it is a very serious th uh, condition. You have to treat it immediately. We, I did abdominal ultrasound. It was normal. I did an echo. It was normal. It was normal. Then we put it on lidocaine. Lidocaine is the drug of choice for VT. Initially, you have to give 2 milligram per kg body weight bolus for one minute period. Then you can do this as a bolus up to half an hour. And 
up to 8 milligram per kg you can reach, and you can wait whether it subsides. If it's not happening, since uh, lidocaine is of very, a uh, half-life is very low, no, it's a less than half, so you have to give a CRI. So CRI dose is around 25 to 75 microgram per kg per minute. So we did that CRI, almost CRI was done with the lidocaine for nearly four hours, nothing. So this is the patient. That is the earlier uh, thing when it was. Initially, one or two normal beats are coming, but it was persistent. So one thing about uh, uh, VT treatment is using lidocaine is lidocaine won't uh, have effect if the potassium levels are low. So you have to correct the potassium levels. When you have a potassium, correct potassium level, it will work well. So it persisted, and that is the Maybe mild effect was there, but it wasn't enough. So after four hours, we discontinued. And the patient is OK. He's not very unstable. So I thought we'll do something orally. And they are also inpatient, the owners. He was, a, he was a secretary in the government. So he wants to attend to his duty. So he was also inpatient. So I thought we'll go with orally. So I started with oral sotolog, plus a diuretic because it was edematous lesion and an antibiotic coverage was given, and uh, botchlor was given to correct the potassium level orally. So after five days of treatment, I told him to come back. See the difference. So this is after five days. You have a clean P wave, QRS complex, and a T wave. From this, it ended up in this, OK? So sotolol is the drug of choice for VPCs in veterinary patients. Suppose sotolol is not working, then you have to combine with mexilitin. Sotolol is a class three. It's a sotolol is not working. Okay. Okay. So I'll cover one more uh, uh, very shortly, and then I'll finish it because of lack of time. Okay. Okay. This one is better. So he's Tyson, uh, he's a boxer, four and a half years male, a brindle, uh, 30 kg body weight. And the owner reports he's having a, a syncope, that is temporary loss of consciousness. Sometimes you will be finding difficulty in identifying whether it's a syncope or seizures. Sometimes seizures also will mimic syncope. Most of the time, the seizures starts when the animal is sleeping, lying down calmly. <laughs> But where a syncope happens, when it is agitated, when it is very anxious, this, when, whenever some, somebody ringing doorbell, it will go rush and then it will faint. Okay, some temporary, few minutes, it'll, few, sorry, few seconds it will be there. Okay, otherwise it is normal. Okay. The auscultation showed it is uh, having some extra systoles in between. So we did an ECG. So what is this? So you see in between some VPCs, no? This is a VPC of right ventricular origin. Earlier I showed VPCs of left ventricular origin. This is a VPC of, otherwise, a right ventral batch block will, uh, is mimics the VPC of left ventricular origin. A left ventral branch block will mimic the VPC of right ventricular origin. OK. So this one, you see many, no? Of, of course, in this lead itself, you see around four VPCs. This is the reason for syncope. I did an echo, it was all normal, nothing. So everything was normal. What is your diagnosis? It's a very common disease in boxes. It's an arithmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, which is called ARVC. Okay. So I started with Sotolol. Sotolol is a drug of choice, as I said a 2.5 milligram BID, and of course, successfully it was managed. The frequency of that episodes came down, and almost after a week, it was all normal. OK. So coming back, if I don't see anything in my ECG strip, if I don't see any VPCs, but still the owner reports syncope, what you'll do? It's syncope can happen, sorry, the, this type of uh, VPCs can happen any time, no? 
over 24 hours period. So you need a halter monitoring. If you don't see it in the paper, if you see it in the paper, you treat. If you don't see it, if you have a halter, you can put it around for 24 hours, get the recording, and read it how many VPCs happened over a period of 24 hours. So, so this is how. So if you see it 0 to sing, uh, 20 singles within normal limits, so you can ignore it. There is no need to treat that. If you see 200 to 100, sorry, 20 to 100 singles, you keep monitoring the patient to see whether the frequency is increasing every 6 to 12 months. If it is 100 to 300, it's quite suspicious. So don't breed for a year and then repeat it. If it is 300 to 1,000, it's likely an ARVC. And if it is more than 1,000, it is confirmed it's an ARVC. You have to start treatment. No other option. So you can ask me, why not you just leave it as such? It may end up in a dilated cardiomyopathy. It may end up in a heart failure if you're not treating it. So this is the treatment protocol, general recommendations. You can use Sotalol alone as a monotherapy at between the range of 1.5 3.5 milligram. So, to la so earlier Sotagod was there in the market. Now, the only thing available is Sotalar. You can note it down. Suppose with the Sotalol, uh, you are not able to control it. Then you think about adding Mexilit. Mexilit is a lidocaine analog. It is available in the market for human patients. So it's easily available. So Sotalol and Mexilitin will be the next choice. I don't prefer using Mexilitin and Atinolol. I just go with most of the patients, it will respond with Sotalol and Mexilitin. I didn't have any problem with this. OK. So I think I should complete, no? Or any time you've given, I'll cover one more patient. Five minutes, very difficult. OK, I'll try. OK, this is one more patient. It is he's quite dyspneic at rest. So you can see. Uh, so it is cyanotic, sternal recumbency, abdominal distension, everything was there. And you saw pulmonary crackles. It's mild difference between the previous case and this one. I'll just rush through. So it SPO, SPO2 measured only 80%. That means what the oxygen tension we expect there, what will be the PAO2? OK, anyway. And it all, by ABG, it had a respiratory alkalosis. Because of hyperventilation, it developed respiratory alkalosis. Um, and this one. Now you tell me, when the SpO2 was 80, what is the oxygen tension? So where is 80? I'll go to 80 here. What is the oxygen tension? Only 50, 50 mmH. What is the normal oxygen tension? 80 to 120, you know, in that range it should be, OK. So, so it needs oxygen supplementation immediately. And it is the ECG of it. It's a, it's a very easy, easy ECG for you now. It's an atrial fibrillation. Of course, it had a severe edema, pulmonary edema, and cardiac enlargement. And that's the echo of that patient. It's having a dilated cardiomyopathy with severe systolic dysfunction. So that is the diagnosis. It's an acute decompensated heart failure. <clears throat> the compensated heart failure don't have much signs, panicky signs. Huh? But it's a decompensated, so it needs hospitalization. You cannot discharge the patient by giving oral medications. So it was sedated with butyphenol, and then it started with furosemide at the dose rate of 4 milligram per kg body weight as an IV bolus, and oxygen at 6 liters per minute. And we started the dobutamine at the dose rate of 2.5 milligram per, to microgram per kg, and then increased to 10 microgram because it can have adverse effects. That's why we are carefully starting it. And then the furosemide is repeated hourly response. CRI furosemide I don't prefer because we, we may overload it. Ordinarily there is congestion, and the oxygen was done by intranasal, not with mask, intranasal. With 
And after 24 hours of dobutamide therapy, the rate was reduced to 50% because the patient is improving. That means edema is improving. And the oxygenation is improving. To monitor it, you have to monitor the SpO2 value. That's an indication it is improving. Okay. And the patient was stabilized at 30 hours of initiation. And the transition was done for oral therapy. This is how you treat a patient when it is acutely presented with dilated cardiomyopathy. This signs. He wants to euthanize this, the owner. After this, it lived nearly for two years. And it revived from dilated cardiomyopathy. Later, it developed a chronic kidney disease and died of it. Very later, after two, four, almost four years, uh, three, three years later. Okay, that's it. Any questions? No questions at all? Thanks, Professor Jai Raja. And next sponsor session by Sava Vet. A cell phone was recovered from the restaurant. If any of you have lost it, please come and collect it from us. A cell phone was recovered from the restaurant. Good afternoon, one and all, sir. Um, my name is Krishnamurthy. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thanks to SAPAC PN team to give a better opportunity to introducing Savat products one more time. Uh, only a few products, sir. That is also available in this year only. This is the all are the new products only. Uh, and enriching the lives of, uh, lives of campaign in always forever. Uh, this is a carotid injection, sir. This is a relaunching uh, in uh, Pasawa, uh, Bombay. Already October anniversary is available in the market, 2 ml vial. Uh, especially for the postic operation and any trauma surgical condition, you can recommend it, sir. 1 ml content, 50 mg. Uh, Subcut only, sir, this one is. Uh, one more is a new product, sir. Fl uh, Floritas is a brand name. Uh, in that content and uh, physetic acid, sir, especially for superficial fried derma and uh, superficial fried derma. Available in 30, uh, 30 mg, sir. This is one more new product, sir, uh, was in a, uh, two uh, imparted ingredients, sir. One is an NSTL carnison and uh, NSTL uh, sodium carboxymethyl cellulose. One is a lubrication purpose and one is for the uh, antioxidant, sir. Uh, one more product is WC, sir, only in ointment. This is herbal ointment, uh, fast healing, uh, antiseptic condition. Any uh, nick free also, sir, and nick free also. Uh, the brands that you have trusted for uh, years, uh, one is in Piperport Plus, sir. You have Piperport Plus as Methaprin. Uh, one more is in Safer, sir, Pimobend, and available in 1.25mg, 5mg, 10mg, sir. The Caradil. Uh, lecithin, both are antioxidants, sir. Essential methane, silvin, A plus B. Uh, one more is an itchmen, is a cyclosporin, capsule gel. Uh, overall, 30, uh, 30 ml and 50 ml is also available, sir. One more is in kebab, sir. All complete dewarming range. The comprehensive antibody portfolio Savavet has, sir. Five overall, two topical and two injections, sir. Uh, Doxy and Bioclan, Safavet, Stab and Toxomox, Ataxin. Uh, 
uh, step and up, sir. Doxy monon promise F12 injections is available. This one, Salafort, sir, uh, Salamectin, uh, cat and dog, sir, cat 6% and dog 12%, sir. Uh, according to the body weight, uh, up to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60 is available. The tube is different, sir, Tiptan is you. Polyphy technology, sir, this one, tube is. This is an add caliber to liver, sir, caliber ursodioxy chloride, sir, uh, liver portfolio. This one, Refimate, sir, hematonic tablet and iron tablet. Uh, this is a Tarian, sir, both are antioxidants. Uh, Tarian, sir, and an NSTL system, sir, this one, sir. Then, uh, Oropet, Oro sir, probiotic dental drops for the flag and tartar and ginger and inflammation. This is a new product, sir, that will be coming by month of January, uh, uh, dust track. Uh, this is a supplementary for in uh, bone, sir, this one, is it? This one is in Pondet and this is also a new product. This will be available in the next month, sir. Uh, Mematazone Propanitis, uh, topical solution. This is our continued journey, sir. Uh, thank you for being the better and stronger and always together with you, sir. Good evening. Uh, today's uh, presenter, our beloved professor, Dr. Tilagar, former vice chancellor of Tanwas. He guided many MEAC and PhD students. Now, here, here, here on the stage to discuss about the, some of the surgical condition. Thank you, Dr. Sorry, I came in front of you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, okay. Um, after good lunch, he had a two lectures. Probably your uh, napping period should have been over by this time. Uh, that's a tough task given by your president, Sapak. He was planning for a long time to take revenge on me. <laughs> so he gave a topic, a very difficult topic, a critical wound. Hey, JP, there is not classified in the book, any book. No, sir, you give. You want this, this, this for a member. I accepted. OK, I'll try to browse because the age of 69, you know, gathering materials, making slides on my own, and coming here, presenting, I feel so happy. So this is how the topic has been joined up. I was a member of the SAPAC long time before, nearly about nine, 10 years before I was maintaining the account. There also a tough task he has given to me. You please take care of this. So with this, thank you, SAPAC member and the president and all the executive member, and the organizing team for choosing this topic. Although I've given the same topic in a different platform, maybe five, six times, this is a little deviated from normal delivery. So I will take you. Yesterday, there was a honor to me, given honor to me. I feel so proud to receive. Maybe this is the, starting from my career as a professor of surgery till the former vice chancellor Tan was. Maybe this, 
should have indicated that the JP and the SAPUNG members or SAR can be honored. I thought for giving a delivery, they are giving a shield. So when I went to the room and read, it was giving a different meaning. So thank you so much. And many of participants here may not know me. The years between 2003 to 7, I was not in the university. I was outside the university. So for knowing me, who is the Tilagar, so this is what. Who I am now, I am practicing agriculture. No more doing veterinary practice now. I am not doing any veterinary practice now. The sense, I do attend conferences, give speech, attend some technical meeting or government meeting. Otherwise, I don't go. So this is the product which I grow in my farming. You can see here, two small kids were picking up the cotton. Whenever they come for a holiday to my house, farmhouse, this is the work I give to them. So I save one or two labors on that. This is my grandchildren. So I, I, they know who, what is cotton, how it grows, and they attend a practical session there and do help for me also. So this is what I'm doing now. Apart from that, I have some coconut tree also. After retiring from my chancellor, I went inside the land, which my father gave. I made it green everywhere, about seven, eight acres. I got satisfied. And this area also. Let me go for the actual topic, which JP has given to me. I think you know all of you JP, J. Pragash. So we call him shortly as JP. The classification, I, I want to take you back to the surgery, surge 4, 1, 1, or whichever the trimester pattern or semester pattern. Based on the durations and the contaminations, we classify into two, three, A, B, C, D. Clean wound, all of you are familiar with that. When the case reported there, immediately we do some washing, suturing it, and this was the case, excellent results. But Clean contaminated happened between six to six hours, below six hours, and contaminated between six to 12 hours, and older than 12 hours. This is a very, very a difficult job for us, all of us. Forget about the first one. Immediate wound attending to clinic, but in veterinary practice, it's very difficult the owner to bring clinic, unless otherwise you have everywhere clinic, nook and corners. These three are under discussion now. Clean contaminated, that is the wound, affected between six, zero to six hours, this is about six to 12 hours, and after 12 hours. The critical wound, I, I classify these three under the topic given as a, these are the one which needs attention. I don't know how, how you approach now in many clinics. Clinics are variety in nature. That is single man clinic, have some staff under, under them, or go for a bigger venture in a hospital setup. So in these three, it varies between clinic to clinic. The same classifications goes in a different way. A primary closure, close immediately. There is a one that, that is immediate. Case comes to your clinic and you are closing it. And the delayed primary, secondary closure, and the healing by second intention, all with the different types of wound. When it's a contaminated with a different nature, that is, 0 to 6, 6 to 12, and more than 12. This is a wound at concave surfaces, and this is a severe lacerated wound. I hope you remember this gentleman, Halstead Principles of Surgery. He did long time before. After that, nobody has revised this principle. A stalwart in surgery, they, because this basic is very important. This seven. It must be done under aseptic technique. Any handling of tissues, any handling, is a minor wound or a bigger wound. So aseptic technique is very important. Gentle tissue handling, putting a finger and putting grinding the tissues, not at all going to give a good results for you. Rather, you are damaging more than the etiological factor has cost. Accurate hemostasis. When the wound is bleeding, you cannot do any work. You have to stop the bleeding, then you started doing the work. But this case is not in a bigger vessel. A bigger vessel is using, you have to ligate the vessels and stop for some time, or put your hemostat, or put your, your artery forceps, then you start doing a work. Preservation of local blood supply. This is very, very important when you don't know the exact anatomy of the particular area 
where in which the wound has been cast. Proper approximation of the tissues and the tissue closing without tension. These two points, very important, probably some of the slides coming behind this tells about how the tension has been relieved in some of the cases and how you have to properly oppose two edges of the skin. There should not be any dead space while you're suturing it. Can you raise your hand, any one of you, a, a case, I don't know, the first slide which I show, a cat having a very big wound. Can any one of you say that what is your approach on the case? Of course, the answer will come after this. If not after this, probably do you close. How you will approach that case? The case was a bad injury in a small cat reported immediately to the hospital within six hours. Anyone knowing some answer at least? Not surgery faculty. I mean practitioner in general. Yes, please. Second intention. What is your approach? How are you cleaning? Flushing. Uh, okay. So at least he has got some point. The flushing or the lavaging the wound surface is a very, very important. That's what I said. The proper approximation, this is very important. And you can see every slides how wound closure is very important in the practice. Once the case is coming to your clinic, the first priority is patient's priority. The animal met with an, an accident, a road accident having a lacerated wound on the chest cavity or outside the chest. But see that the animal might have a diaphragmatic hernia also. Without focusing for diaphragmatic hernia, you start repairing the wound. Animal collapse after some time. So the patient priority, stabilize the patient, then you go for your surgery. The second one is management without surgery. The management Cable loose connector. Some problem. In the, the? Power layer. I don't know. Then why you not? I'm going to display it. Get the report burn. I'm 
already put there. Okay. Okay. Sorry. <coughs> so this is the one that we suture it. We, we just take care of the wound without suturing it. Dressing, healing, and enhancer. There is a lot of products that have come in the market now. Earlier, we used to only go for antiseptic or antibiotic ironman. Now, there are a lot of stimulants and enhancer wound healing products that have come in the market, thanks to the pharmaceuticals. When we were all doing practice in the early 80s and 90s, not much of ointments were available for a wound healing. Now, there are a lot of biomaterials, uh, wound, healing, wound healing enhancer that has come. Even yesterday, I saw some board here. here they, they displayed here. So the old Bartrophe spray has got a, some wound healing effect. So that was a finding there, right? And apart from these two, this is a challenging one. Flap, undermining, and closure. This is where we normally expect a help from somebody. Can you come and attend the case like that? So this is the one. My, my lecture will be mostly on concentrating on this. And drainage is a com important for these two categories. I don't know how many of you are using drainage in your clinics. It gives very good results when you start using it. I was giving an example when a case met with a road accident. A chance for diametric area. A chance for internal injury. We normally focus to the CNS system and causing inadequate dentation, circulation, severe bleeding. This must be taken care first before we go for a wound closure. A screening of the patients for internal injury, especially diaphragm or internal hemorrhages, we have to work out. Then you go for a stabilize the patient, then you go for your. Sometimes, animal with a wound may require all these things. The evidence of upper respiratory system injury, oxygen supply, you have to do it. We have we put on a ET tubes in the airway. If possible, tracheostomy, very rarely it comes. And do some corticosteroid injection, stabilize the patient. At the same time, you must take care of your lower respiratory chest cavity also. Just tube placement or needle thoracocentesis and uh, sealing the wound with the KO jelly. Any, any, any jelly, any jelly with antiseptic and antibiotic, you can use it. Some antibiotics are against the wound healing process. It destroys the fibro uh, macrophages and other ones, so we should not use it. So initially, you have just bandage the wound, cover it. Stabilize the patients, give some fluids, then you plan it. As somebody was mentioning here, a secondary closure of a primary closure. Of course, depends on the clinic. We have a gas, yes, put it in the gas, so that you can work very slowly. Patiently, you can do, you're not in a hurry. You are not supp supposed to do any practice in a hurry. At the same time, if you go for local for small injuries, lidocaine, or sometimes with the epinephrine, and there was a debate, the epinephrine addition to the local anesthetic is will interfere with the healing process. So you are well with your local lidocaine or xylocaine, so you can use it and start using it. When you go for a larger, bigger wound, the extent is bigger, you can go for always general anesthesia. Clipping of the hands, avoid close clipping in some areas. Especially this cat had a severe injury on the eye. So they closed very closely the eyebrow, everything. At the end results, the owner started stouting. So it was a case when I attended in EPM Malaysia. The eyebrow, very important for the female cats, also male or female. So he, the cat could not produce the eyebrow lashes. The owner got angry and shouted in the clinic, what happened? So this was done by an internees. A mistake done by internees, and we apologize them, sorry. So for you, please take, when you go for shaving or cleaning here, you must be, not, should not do very closely. I don't know, clippers are available. Elderly clinician here working, I think, more than 60. Those years, we used to use razor or blade. Razor or blade. 
So you used to have a stock in the hospital and use it. Now I think clippers are available. I don't know how many of you are using your clipper. It is better to have a close the wound, then you start your cleaning the area. So this is the one, whether it is available here, I don't know. When I was working, KY jelly is the very important. Now you can find out whether it's available. It's a beautiful product. Scrubbing the area around the wound. After cleaning, we have to use a sterile water or a soluble cell application, preferably 2 to 4% chlorhexidine. Easily available now. Chlorhexidine product, oral wash or our wound wash. With this strength, it is available. You are lucky practitioners of 2023 or from 20 onwards. You can buy and lavage it. And it is effective for both gram negative and gram positive bacteria. And this is also another one, methyl resistant staphylococcus aureus. They are telling that it is effective against. Why should wound should be clean, lavage? There was a question he answered. It helps in removing the dead tissue and clots. For a naked eye, you will get only a white tissue on the surface of the wound, some debris. So inside, there may be some bacteria and foreign materials, dead tissues and clots. So it is always call it these all contaminants. Dipping a cotton in a saline solution or saline solution or ringer lactate, wiping the wound, not good. Or tipping in the gas, wiping it, not good. Please don't do that. Still I am watching it. When I visit some of the clinics, they do it. Just mopping. No, not at all good. Then how you should do? There's a method. When a wound comes to your clinic, like this is a bigger wound. Sutured, suture has breakdown. You can see the suture material around this. So quickly they approach it and suture it, and they've had a failure. So such type of wound, before you go for a closure, you just plan this method of bandage. In places where you are not able to apply a bandage properly. In this area, the bandage never stay. You apply the bandage, the next day dog will come, bandage will be in the house only. So this is another approach. You do it immediately. Clean this area, put this pad, tighten it. How it has been done? No, no, remote is nowhere. This cannot play in remote. There is some problem somewhere else. There is some problem. Guy. Yeah, it is going. Now it is not displaying. Where are the connections? Oh, we'll see what it is. Horizontal mattress, or a vertical mattress. Through this, the tap has been completely passed crosswise and fixed it. So this will stay for even three days, four days. You plan your suturing method or the day which you want to do it. Open it and do it. Yeah, I'll try once again. Yeah. 
This is only a model. You take a lot of observations. Even the gas place is done by using a gloves. From one side to other side, from one side to other side, from other side to this side. So you keep on changing it. This cannot be removed unless otherwise there is already a late suture is there. Through that, you have to pass on and loop it outside. The many wound which are located in a place where you cannot do any bandaging, this is good. Still, you go for a flapping, a suturing technique, whatever the method you want to do it. Even three, four days, you can keep it. It is a must. It's a must. Even I was not doing this practice when I was a clinician, starting from the days 2000, before seven. The great difficult, my attendant taught me how to put up a proper bandage in Thanwas, I'm telling. The old man has come from Andhra Pradesh. They put very nicely the bandage. They just try to explain and teach us how to use it. Is it okay? Only gas, only gas. No, no, you don't use cotton. The fiber will become one second of foreign materials on the wound. So gas is always better. This is the Elster Plus bandage. You've got a lot of variety now. It has come. You can just, even readily available. Thank you, man. So this gives a protection. Yeah, I have the one more. So this, this gives a protection to the wound. Deep right, it says that it is deep right also, and it absorbs the exudate, and the topical medication delivery promotion also wound healing. Sometimes, when you don't plan for a week, the first layer of the gas can go for some medicated gas, then you can apply bandage. I was telling to you, don't mop with a cotton or gas. You have to flush. The technique is called lavage. So just pouring and cleaning does not work. Does not work in the sense you can start practicing it, but the results will not be that good as you practice the other way. It should be in a pressure of eight pounds per square inch. How you get eight pounds per square inch? You use 30 M 35 ml syringe with a 19 gauge needle. Simple. These two are available in your clinic. Just take a syringe, attach with this needle, and flush with the fluid. It removes all contaminants. See that the area is so fresh to look, and it cleans all contaminants from the wound. What will happen if you go for 18 gauge needle instead of 19 or 16? That will give you a high pressure. So that high pressure will push all your contaminants to the deep inside the wound. So this has been arrived, many research has been done for 35 ml syringe with a 19 gauge. You can use it, readily available in your clinic, you can use it. You can attach with the syringe also, three-way cannula. So you can draw that, flush it, draw and flush it. Recommended fluid. Seal hold is good. The 0.9% saline is always good. Or lactate ringer. There is a ready-made available in our overseas, Pluronic F68. In many clinics, the day the case comes today, you use some saline bottle or regulated bottle, there is a balance available, start using it. You allow to hang for one day or two days, you cannot reuse it for your intravenous. So this can be used for your wound cleaning if the case comes. That's why you can reduce your cost of expenses also. Accidentally or by mistake, we have been using this, all these preparations. I don't know. But all of you are not using it, I'm so happy. If somebody is using it, please don't use it. It's a controversial one. What controversial it can produce? It, it, it can affect the keratinocytes, fibroblasts available in the wound that it delay the wound healing process. That was a finding they did it.
toxic to fibroblasts, neutrophil, and so many cells available in the bed surface. This was the one. When we were the student, we used to, we have been taught like this, mix some fluid with antibiotics. That will take care. Yes, they will be using it. Effectiveness in killing bacteria is antibiotic mostly, antibiotic. But toxicity to the tissues, the, these two antibiotics will less. Uh, limited in infected wound only. Only in infected wound, I was telling you more than 12 hours wound, you can use it. Otherwise, with the pline, saline, and ringolactate is enough. Non-surgical approved, most of the clinics, most of the practitioners does that. Unless otherwise, the gap is very big. They don't think for closure. So these are all product available. Wound spray, antibiotic, antiseptic hydrogels, chloroxin gel is available. See, it was very difficult to get chloroxin solution 10 years before. That was a good experience that even I bought from abroad for my practice. Now you get gel available to 4%. Enzymatic damage project is available, product, collagenases. The name is Sanitel and Papes, Papain enzymes, Papaya from Papaya, larval therapy, compost film application, biomaterial applications, collagen biomaterial, keratinocyte biomaterials. They take and process. The one institute in India, that is in Chennai, Central Leather Research Institute, done a lot of work on these biomaterials for wound healing alone. And medicated gas, honey. I don't know how many of you are I mean, faith on honey. Not for taking one teaspoon of honey and putting in the coffee with the tea or like that. The honey is a beautiful wound healer. I met one professor from University of Malay, Abdul Qadar. His name is Abdul Qadar. He needed 40 PhD thesis on honey alone on wound healing. 40 PhD thesis. In Asia, he is the leader in the wound healing process. So all take care of the infection, exudate reductions, and assist in wound healing process, making some changes in the tissues, and make perfect cleaning. After some time, you can see that this product you can try if nothing walk out in your clinic. Besides, you go for a physical therapy on biomaterial also. The book says that this, bio, this electrical stimulation, vacuum assisted therapy, this all helps in wound healing. Some says it's good, some says it's not good. So there's always a question, but you can try, you have facilities. I was telling to limited use in clinics. How many clinic has got on the physical, physiotherapy equipments? Very difficult. Having a small x-ray is itself is a challenging. This is the commercial product available, thanks to the pharmaceuticals. Once we were doing a practice, 80s, 90s, these are all not available in the market. You can see so many products have come. Pfizer has come out, Integral Life Sciences, and Johnson Johnson, Medcan, Medfield, Video Laboratories, Derma Sciences. As did a lot of research on healing of the wound, especially in animals, not in human, in animals. And they recommended and produced a product, and they've released in the market. And they, these are being used in a open wound. Negative pressure wound therapy. You create some negative pressure on the wound bed surface. The negative, wound, negative pressures will suck, exudate, and some of the discharge and collect it outside and discharge. So that will make the wound heal faster. So this was one. These are the indications. You can use either acute or chronic abscesses, deglow injuries, burn injury. The cat which I showed in the first slides. This, this is the perfect one. A joint for skin and flap crafting and necrotic facility. I mean, fasciitis and severe vasculitis. So these are all the conditions you can use your negative pressure treatment, wound therapy. This was a case one. A special form. The negative pressure wound therapy has got a special form. Dressing must cover with a gas, ideally a single piece. With the wound too large, multiple pieces may be utilized to gain adequate coverage. The site is connected to a vacuum pump maintain negative pressure. You can see here open wound, placing a lot of gas material. This is also a case broken down. Once again, suture is broken down. Place it, then you close it as 
don't put any gas. So you close it with that, you attach it to the vacuum pump, so that will remove all the x-rays from this, allow the wound to heal fast. Contraindications, when there is a case with a severe dermatitis, necrotic and deviolation tissues, major vessel injuries, open joint, wound container neoplastic tissue, tissues, untreated osteomyelitis, please don't try this. So this was a limitation about this treatment. This is some of the antibiotics specifically mentioned for a skin treatment, penicillin group, aminoglycosides, second generation cephalosporin. I am talking today, maybe in 2025, there may be new antibiotics has come, may come in the market. So we have to keep on changing it. That is, update your knowledge, update your practice to the present market availability. Here only the JP comes. The challenge he has given to me, how will you jump? Either to jump or fall here or go back once again. The first slide image. This was treated successfully. Imagine how it was possible. I'm amazed to see that this was treated in a cat nearly for six weeks, if I am correct, six weeks. Compared to dog, cat skin has got a healing process. It's very good, very good compared to dog. And removal of the dead tissue here, why we have to remove this? When you remove only, you get a high oxygen tension at the wound bed surface. The oxygen tension is important for a wound healing. Increase the activity of the WBC and bacteria. If you don't do that, with the necrotic tissue, you see, this all the white necrotic tissue available in the border. We would never heal. Somebody was presenting in the morning, I think, um, uh, some atopic dermatitis, Dr. Naraj was presenting. After 40 days of struggle, the owner called me, sir, cat passed away. So this is what the results will happen. So this is very important for us. How will you do it? A scissor which cannot cut even the hair cannot be used here. Many, many, even in teaching hospital, I am saying that. I'm sorry, um, staff here in my town was never. I, I've been experienced that situation. I was working in outpatient surgical for more than 14 years continuously. Sometimes you don't get a sharp scissors. So we need a sharp instrument and we must go from the superficial to the deep. How extend you go? You keep on cutting, at one point of time, you'll get slowly a bleeding. Good. That bleeding is the point, you got a live tissue there. Till then, you have to cut. And if there is any nerves and tendons, remember your anatomy, safeguard it. When you're lifting the fibrous tissue, or the white tissue, you may likely lift the nerve also. Please don't do that. You cannot cut that easily. It, it, it can't give the elasticity. So wait, judge, then you go. The golden period is 6 to 12 hours. 0 to 6 is the one, 6 to 12 is the one. Decide, based on the extent of the damage, what technique you should follow. You go for a skin flap, you, swoop, you go for a graft, you go for uh, uh, incision closure. So these are all the ones you decide. And the adequacy of the blood supply is available. A wound is there. You put your finger or your uh, artery forceps on both sides of the one or your uh, uh, tissue forceps. You try to lift the skin. Opposite. With no difficulty, the two tissue forceps or artery forceps or your finger is opposing with no tension force available, you can start going for a suturing. You bring two edges, whatever the instrument you use, it, I, I don't bother. You bring it, lift it. There should not be any tension. Leave it, it can come closer, then go oil for oil. Primary closer is important. I mean, it's direct opposition is okay. Sir, this, this is the wound one. It has come like this. There's no. A straight incision, there's no cut here, but there is small, some more damage here. 
How will you approach? No, even if it is wrong, don't worry. By doing, committing mistake only, you can learn. Direct suture, opposition. Subcriticular. Direct opposition, no? No. Very good. Direct opposition is also OK. But there may be some space, dead space will come here, even after suturing. If that is the case, you should go for a drain. You want, somebody was telling. What is that you are mentioning? Subcortical. You go for unremaining suture, walking suture, we call it. You go in deep, suture it, come out. From bottom to the edges, you have to come. So that the surface which is being deeply available will be touching the skin in a perfect manner. There won't be any dead space. Come. If everything is good, then you can go for your skin suturing at the end. Using your whatever the material available, non-absorbable, whatever the material available. So this is how you have to go for a linear defect. How to measure? Some defect in oval shape are circular. This cannot oppose. Even your uh, undermining suture or whatever suture, it has to be extended the edges so that you make the wound in a bigger wound. One is to four. Suppose you have four inches of wound here, one inch in the outer extent, and the corner, wound edges, commissure. So that it becomes totally five inches. You can start easily suturing it. Without extending, you start suturing it. What will happen? So there will be a pouch here, the end. It will not be perfectly closed. There will be a slight pouch on that, which can be corrected only by this way. Is it clear? If it is a rectangular or a square shape, this also is a case, a cat. This was one, a rectangular, an example of a rectangular. You can just start suturing it in the middle first. You extend on both sides, this way and this way and this way. Cut it. So once you cut it, this rectangular surface here, you start doing here, here on. So you start here on, here on, here on, here on. So automatically this will heal automatically. So the rectangular can make a, a four cross incisions with the central one. You can start suturing it. You won't have a, any problem. Can I go to the next slide? This was one cat started treating it. The contraction has come like this. Still, the owner wants to do it. I don't want to see this. They have been treating in the private clinic. They started somehow or other. The wound should have been like this one. So slowly come here, an algae wound with a lot of tensile force underneath. How it can be done? You just remove the border. Start doing this border, lifting it, undermining. Use a sharp BP blade, put under the skin, keep on cutting it, the entire surface. Place one second in the walking sucker, which we did for the, the oval one. Then you start closing it. Still a bigger case, a case which you have seen it. More the dead space with the oval shape. The same thing, you can separate once again skin from the fascia parallel to the proposed direction of the advancement. In the direction that you are going to do that, so you have a suture here, then you start suturing. If you are not putting a, a walking suture here, 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 then here, 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 once again you'll get a dead space. This is how we do it, undermine the skin. And I'm just putting here suture, placement of suture. Starting from the center, go to the edges. Don't start from the edges. If you start from the edges, you cannot go to the middle one in depth. So you should start from in the center. You go this side, then you go to the, the same way as the other side. Then you can start suturing it. So the nutshell in that, you go for a walking suture. You should start from the center to the periphery. 
ये अपर स्टेट Wound is healing, but there's a tensile force on second day or third day. You observe it. What you can do is, you can do one to two centimeter of incision like this on either side of the wound. Just put an elliptical incision, maybe or 10 or 12 or 15, so that this skin tension will automatically will get reduced. The suture line will not disturbed. Clear or not clear? Okay. Ah, it's come. Skin flap and craft. This is a wide topic was assigned to me. I'll stick on to some few flap and craft. Complete coverage. It gives everything a cosmetic look, functional one, and good blood supply. Whereas a partial coverage will not give it that cosmetic result. But sometimes you need. Flap is also good. Needs a circulation there. When you lift a graft, you need a blood circulation, then you can put it in the blood surface. Here I am maintaining the root here, the graft here. There is an attachment here. This is also a case. Rising the bed, before you rise it, Inject with the saline, subcutical saline, as well as the crinalzo. And remove all subcutaneous tissue to lower the root. So you have a lot of subcutaneous tissue here. You have to just remove all those things. Don't flap. Immediately don't put under the one. So you have to harvest it. Not on the subcutaneous tissue, you have to harvest it. You can see a lot of hair root, black, black spot on the skin. So that is the place. It is ready for grafting. Check you have a blood supply, you have good contact with the bed, and restriction of the mobility. After placement, see here. I'm just uh, removing all the tissues. Then you start suturing it, the non or bubble suture, preferably. This is another cat. We harvested from here, fixed here. Here, a flap technique has been used for a bigger wound, harvesting from the cranial part, opposition suture, plus relaxing incision. So three, these three techniques have been farmed. This is the complete coverage of skin craft. So there's a lot of varieties. It is in the book, you know very well. And this is a graft one is just placing the skin graft there and there, close it. This will take long time to cover. So this is uniformly you have to replace it. Start uniformly with a uh, constant interval. So automatically this also will heal. But this is very difficult compared to this one. How to judge? Sir, I need grafting. Well, hair doesn't come. Skin still has got a hole. Yes. You cannot expect the healing within three weeks time. It takes even more than that. This is the day one here. Sorry. Day one here. You can slightly see that a blood vascularity, red in color. Here, the red has changed here. The second picture, day fourth. Slightly watery. The slightly x-rays are coming. Color has been changed from here to here. This is the day 11. A day 11 graft, you can see that the linear incision has become small. The color has been improved now. Color, you are not able to see that. The hemorrhage, the red color, you are not able to see that. Skin suture is intact. Sometimes what will happen when there is going to be a rejection, in the borders you will get a black in color. You have to be very careful. That was the point. We have to focus. Yes, sorry. This is not accepted. Got rejecting the graft. So one second, remove it, redo it. Nothing wrong in it. If the patient is a good client for you, patient is good, client is also good. Because any wound treatment, the owner will not be keep quiet. He'll keep on asking, how long will it take, sir? How much it cost? These are uh, yeah, 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 questions from the owner or the clients. They'll ask, ask, because you have to be very careful. When the owner is able to pay you, yes, you can try this.
this is suture material. I think you have studied in your textbook. Absorbable suture, you can use it. A lot of suture materials come. This is the non-absorbable for skin. You can use it anywhere. Anyone you can use it. Only thing is you go for, this is all a costly one. Recollecting old clinicians using a cotton thread. Very simple, it comes in the roll. Five rupees to 10 rupees. Put it in the autoclave, cut it, require length, and use it. But this is a different one. The results will be good, but costly. Normal suturing, after the skin closure opposition. If it is a head region, animal was wearing E. collar, you can just remove it four to five days. In the other region, it go for seven days. This is all properly you followed aseptic techniques. There are cases, if from my hand, when I started doing, when I was doing walk in abroad, third day we discharge the case. You don't keep it in the clinic. Third day we discharge. Give some tablets, you come after seventh day or ninth day. That's our one. And wound under tension and extremities, it needs seven to ten days removal. Graft suturing, it must go for even two weeks. Two weeks or even three weeks. But make sure that the graft, the edges of the border, is not turning into black in color. If it is a perfect alignment is going on, it's a healing, there is a, you can just put your finger and try to uh, separate it, not with this severe force, very mildly. So there will be resistance. That means the graft has taken. Drains. Very big wound, contaminated wound. These are all the vital component of the wound care. Incorrect management. For example, you pass a drainage tube one side and very close to the suture line here. Very close to the suture line, you bring it outside. It will very badly affect the wound healing. So this, one second, I was telling you to it, eliminate the dead space. Remove all the existing fluid and gas, prevent accumulation of fluid also being avoided. Heavily infected, contaminated wound. It's once again the same thing. When to remove the drainage? Sir, I fixed today. After two days, you see that there is a capillary bleeding, or there is a red blood is coming, blood is coming. You remove 24 hours. When there is an infection, you should go for two to three days. And tissue larger mass removal, tumor removal, the surgical excision of the tumor, a fibrous sarcoma. There, we have to keep for even five to seven days, even more than that. So this is how the duration, how long you should keep the yeah, tube inside. There's a video, how you fix drainage tube. This is the ordinary tube. This is the ordinary tube, Penrose. Oh, this is doing something. Maradi Pedicha, you don't mistake Argma. Hmm? Display only. Is the battery recovered? Yeah. And 
கனெக்டட் வந்து இது இதுல இருந்து ரிசீவ் பண்ணுத அமர்ச்சலாம் அமர்ச்சலாம் இந்த பிளக் வந்து லூஸாக இருக்கா இது ஸ்டாண்ட் பை கொடுக்குறீங்களா இதே இதாக இருக்குல்ல வீடியோ இல்லாமல் கூட இது நெக்ஸ்ட் கொஞ்ச நேரம் வந்துச்சு
this only wrong placement of drainage system, how it will affect animals. Because the organizer has given another three minutes only. I have to finish it. Is it standby? Is it standby? I don't remember. Where are cable? Is that sabotage monitoring, JP? Is that sab? Vengadesan panna maadu, Vengadesan panna maadu. No, no, this is natural, which we cannot. That's what I'm saying. No, 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 no. We can interact for some time. Do you have any questions? I have only a few slides about the drainage, wrong drainage applications will, how badly affect the animal. Plus three questions. Three questions means a difficult case how we handle it, how you will, you will approach. Uh, that was on a forecasting and knowledge from you, then giving answer. So that is the one that. Maybe another 12th more slide is that. So long as that. 0.9%. No, no, normal saline. Normal saline. And for drainage, cover the sheet, manage the cows cover, nowadays you get a lot of techniques are available. Uh, you have a 10 ml syringe. Uh, Three-way cannula, you fix it. Okay, you pass, the, cut the needle, you pass the tube inside. Uh, withdraw the plunger. You make a hole in the plunger. You put a hairpin, some pin inside, so that the pin doesn't allow the plunger to go inside. So the vacuum created. So that vacuum will automatically draw fluid from the wound. That's the one. You can go for uh, the tube which I just wanted now. Uh, the the Penrose died. And plus, you have a suction apparatus. In human, there's a lot of suction. A small bag will be there. Marudi, early, ever da? There is a ready-made available suction apparatus there, there. Small handy one. Uh, a bag will be like this. You collapse the bag, you pass the tube inside, remove the bag so that it will suck all the exudate from that. That also you can do it. Then your three-way cannula suction, I mean, uh, scalpel inside. That also you can pass it. Well, you pass that, the hole you make in the skin should be less than three space diameter, less than the tube. Should be too tight, too tight, so that you can pass it on. And uh, in, the, in, the, in the end, you can fix some bottle. Uh, any, any bottle, you can fix it, preferably leather. Bandage it with animal so that it keeps it. So this is the one. Sometimes what people do it, the uh, drainage TB is fixed only in one side, down. Very close to the suture line. Do you want to take a tube? So there are a lot of materials that are available. In a human hospital, you can use a suction that is called active drainage. You can use it then go for a passive drainage. That is a old one. That is not a good one. That is not a good one. Corrugated sutures, I mean, the drains are available. When we were all practicing, we had it. Please don't use it. So that will overflow, like a Chennai flight, it will overflow on both sides of the bridge. And once again, it goes to the wound only. So don't use that. Not preferable, sir. You know, out of friendship, they used to call clinics, they called to the clinics. I just go and observe, don't make any comment, I come out of the clinics. But please don't use it. No, provider iodine, the result says that it will affect the fibroblast. It, since it contains iodine. 
நீங்கள் என்ன பண்ணுங்கள் இட்ஸ் அ கிரானிக் ஓன் வித் லாட் ஆஃப் பஸ் மெட்டீரியல்ஸ் ஆர் அவைலபிள் யூஸ் இட் ஃபார் ஒன் ஆர் டூ டேஸ் இட் டைல்யூட்டட் போ போய்டு நைடு தென் யூ ரிமூவ் இட் யூ கம் பேக் டு நார்மல் சார் என் லவேஜ் யூ கீப் ஆன் டூயிங் ஃபார் ஒன் வீக் லவேஜ் வித் அ போய்டு நைடு இட் வில் அஃபெக்ட் ஆல் யுவர் செல்ஸ் ஆல் யுவர் அஃபெக்ட் யுவர் செல்ஸ் சரி விட்டுருங்க நீங்கள் ஐ திங்க் சம்படி இஸ் வெயிட்டிங் ஃபார் அடுத்த லெக்சர் ஆல்சோ இல்லை அதுக்கு வெங்கடேஷன் ஏதாவது பண்ணார்னா இது ஓப்பன் பண்ணுங்க இது எங்கே பண்ணுறீங்க it happens in technical session it happens sometimes there is no current kind of file yeah you know the sapak illi illa enoda idu enga irukundra na recognize aagala illa sir ungal kandu varu vandichu illa enoda illa pen drive inge sir இது வந்து ஜேபியோடது சிஸ்டமே மாறுது இந்த பிளே எல்லாம் பிளஸ் பிளே முடிஞ்சிருச்சு அது க்ளோஸ் பண்ணுங்க இது வந்து அது க்ளோஸ் பண்ணிட்டு நீங்க ஸ்லைட்ஸ் போயிடு இந்த ஸ்லைட்ஸ் நம்ம அந்த ஸ்லைட் பண்ணுங்க நீ இங்க வந்து ஸ்லைட் வெச்சீங்களா அதுக்கு வந்து இல்ல இதுல இது கண்டுபிடிக்கிறது கஷ்டம் சரி இந்த எல்லோ நான் பண்ணட்டுமா இல்ல பண்றேன் எத்தனை ஸ்லைட் வெச்சீங்களா அதுக்கு வந்துருங்க அப்புறம் ஸ்லைட் ஷோ ஆன் பண்ணுங்க okay this is this is uh, using a just a minute what do you call it this is a passive a doctor was asking so this is available uh, you can buy and you can cut to your required length and use it the one problem is here it's not that effective compared to the other one you can see the next one how idre polama readily available easy to place it expense is less in number but made of soft tubular structure it can be cut the one problem here in this tube is because it's very soft when you tie with a thread at the exit it may like to strangle it so you have to see that there is a patency of the tube here you can see that the drainage strips are very close to fixed here as well as here this is the results so you should be away from the incision should be away from the incision maybe 2 cm to 3 cm better to avoid the dorsal one so you can see how it has happened here completely damaged excoriation of the skin has happened results this is the wrong placement of the tube how it affect so this is one i was using here you just away from the incision site place it and you have bag here this bags before you fix it you just press it it will collapse so once you pass your tube then release it automatically start collecting put this bag in the dependent one put an abdominal bandage so that you can see the next day how much it's collected this is called active drainage which is better that infection will be less in number i mean less compared to the other one 
The commercial available is Jackson Brad Brainage. This is also available. I was telling the tube. Even for human application, there are a lot of tubes that are available. So you can just browse in the net and find out which company it is manufacturing. So you can buy and keep it. This seems to be quite cheap and as well as good also. The indie made, Indian made design, which I was telling to you. A small butterfly needle can be placed there. Plug the syringe. You put a hole here. Pass the hairpin or whatever the pin you have. Sterilize it and use it. So this piston will not go back. You'll get a gap, the C1. So this gap, the fluid will collect it. Automatically, you can remove it and throw it. Refit or reuse the syringe also. This is using a or IV catheter, butterfly IV drip catheter, attached to the syringe, so automatically it drains. Only thing is the tip has to be cut and put it in the syringe side, reverse it, and the syringe where you adopt, I mean, syringe where you fix with the catheter can be cut, so that the tube will come, tube you can pass it. Any, any question? Please. So this is a, an advantage on your passive system. Active one, you will not give a further infection. When to remove? When it is going to be reduced, 2 to 4 ml per kilogram body weight in 24 hours. That was the mark. Suppose you get it 10 ml in 24 hours, still the fluid is coming. So once you start reducing it, it is better removed normally within 2 to 4 days. After that, don't keep for a long time. Because this animal never keep quiet. You keep on, some, you, some materials are there, it will scratch or remove with the one, it will start irritation, then you'll go for a, a complications. It is better maintained on the degree of irritations. We have to closely monitor. We are selling in the morning, somebody was, uh, I think BN was selling, B Nagaraj was selling. So we have to be very careful in watching and go for a pain assessment. Once again, I appreciate pharmaceuticals uh, for bringing them overseas product to India. Now even tramadol, methadol, so many products are available, but you should get a license, proper license from the concerned authority and use it. So this is all drainage and, I mean, the, the successful manager of the drainage system. Yes, we come back. Can anyone can answer this? How will you manage? A dog with a lacerated wound of 12 hours of duration. You can see how it got a damage. How will you approach? What are the methods you follow? Quick, we will not take Dr. Venkatesan sir time. Deep brain band. The central, central one, you want to cut it and remove it. Okay. You want to do any deep brain band? Lavaging, you want to do it? Then, No, even if it is wrong, nothing, nothing, don't worry about it. How about the muscle? Remove the necrotic tissue. There are a lot of necrotic tissues are here. Remove all the pieces. Then you start suturing the muscle. Then you go for a skin suture. Skin suture, how will you do it? You go for a flap, a single opposite. Simple opposition. Can you raise your hand? Simple oppositions, you will get a price. Oh, only two. Flap. See how it was done. All other answers you gave is wrong. The last one was, that's what I'm telling you. You decide before you go further. You plan your suturing method. This drainage for dry over bandage also you have to do that. The bigger drainage, bigger size dogs will go for a bigger drainage, drain tubes. How you manage this? Any, any ideas? Okay, okay. Clo there is close clipping, applying jelly, then debrading the skin, then undermining. So you have to lift it a little bit. If you lift it, only the skin can be opposed. If, no, if you don't have much skin available, then you should go for a... No, relaxing is the same cereal. Go for a graft or a flap, transversion flap. Okay, should take from the neck, then you can bring it here. A lot of methods are there. 
So this is one here. E collar is important. Close to neck, head. You must have E collar. Otherwise, your entire jobs will be waste. Any idea in this case? No flap, nothing. Just edges have been debraided, muscles have been opposed, and suture it. If necessary, this may require a brain also. Brain also. If the suture breaks down after a week, then you must think of your graft or flap. If some of the lesions which mislead you, you'll be going on treating as an open wound or some wound, persistent chronic wound. So this may be the lesions. You have to do a pathology and check it and change your direction of treatment. Thank you very much. Thank you, SAPAC members. This was the trophy they gave me yesterday. Dr. JP has given it. I didn't know that, but I've gone through the wording. So it, it makes me a happiness. Oh, I did something for a small animal, clinical work in vet practice. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry, Prof. Dr. Vengadesan. No, sir. I've taken your timing. No, sir. Uh, thanks, Professor Telagar, sir. And now we break for a short tea because already we have last time. So I request you all to come back within 15 minutes. Sir, or I'll start. Hmm? Okay. Four minutes. So I'll start, uh, okay, fine. Once again, we are meeting in the evening. So I think, uh, no, no problem, don't worry. Okay, right. Okay, this is not working. <clears throat> so I'll start, okay? So what is chronic kidney disease and how it differs from the acute kidney injury, you should understand. So chronic kidney disease occurs over a period of months to years. It cannot happen overnight. In a day or two, it cannot happen. It should happen overnight, uh, at least for months to years. A minimum of two to three months it will take, okay? What actually happens? The nephrons are damaged and it's an irreversible damage and it is still progressing. So what nephrons are replaced by? Fibrous tissue. That's why it's called as replacement fibrosis. So you can't do nothing with that, replace nephrons with fibrosis. So it is not possible to improve the renal function. It is possible only to stabilize the renal function with the available nephrons. Already fibrosed one, you can't do anything. So how it differs? AKI usually happens very rapidly in 48 hours and uh, the changes are to reversible to some extent. Not always that every AKI is going to recover. To some extent, it's reversible when you intervene properly. Manifestations are very severe. Why? Manifestations in CKD is not very severe, but it's AKI, it's very, very severe. Why? Anybody? Why the manifestations are very severe? Because the system is not used to that rise in urea level, no? If it happens suddenly, it reacts. That's why you'll have severe vomiting, blackish tools, all, all those signs will be very severe and dehydration will be severe. The chronic signs like weight loss, polyuria, polydipsia is not usually appreciated. Why the animal develops polyuria, polydipsia in case of a chronic kidney disease? 
because the tubules will lose its concentrating capability. So it will be polyuric. And when it is polyuric, naturally it should be polydipsic. What will be your differentials for polyuria polydipsia? Diabetes mellitus, chronic kidney disease. This is the most common one. Next comes here, then Cushing's. Very commonly. So these are some of the uh, reasons behind the uh, cause of renal disease. This is a chronic, this is acute, something, there will be some overlapping between this. So you see, uh, leptospirosis causes acute as well as a chronic disease. Early shows this causes chronic disease, something like that. Mainly, this is infectious and toxic. And that one, exactly, it's called self apoptosis. The assault of the, on the kidney is gone, but the fibrosis keep on happening. When you are trying to find out the reason behind this fibrosis, you, you may not be able to find out. Because it has happened long ago, and the process of fibrosis is happening now. So what is the rationale behind the staging of chronic kidney disease? So you have seen this picture in Irish, no? So, so this shows how much uh, there is reduction in renal function. So this part, no? This part, gradually, the nephrons are getting fibrosed. And once almost 67% of nephrons are fibrosed, then it goes to stage 2, where only 33% is functional. So it is classified based on the creatinine level. So if you think you can test creatinine and find out that it's having a renal disease, a chronic disease, it's not possible. Most of the time, you'll miss it, because creatinine is not a very sensitive indicator for glomer filtration rate. Only when 66% or 67% of kidney is compromised, you will have elevation of creatinine. It is not an early marker. Stage 1 is that one that you have uh, maybe around 66% uh, or less is functional. Then stage 2, only 33% of nephrons are functional. Stage 3, only 25%. And stage 4 is only 10% of the nephrons are functional. The staging is done by creatinine between 1.4 and 2.1, that's a recent staging. It is considered as stage two. 2.1 to 5 is stage three, and more than five is stage four. You do substaging also based on the urine protein creatinine ratio, UPC. So whenever there is a renal disease, you will have proteinuria. So you cannot estimate proteinuria, protein alone in the urine because that will change with the hydration status. That's why we are combining with creatinine. I'll tell you the logic behind that. The staging is also done with protein. Uh, less than 0.2 is non-proteinuric. Between 0.2 and 0.5 is borderline proteinuric. And greater than 0.5 is proteinuric. And this one, the staging is done by your systolic blood pressure. So anything above 160, it's hypertensive which is moderate, and more than 180 is severely hypertensive. So you cannot declare hypertension by doing one blood pressure measurement. You have to repeatedly do at least on three, four occasions to confirm that it is having hypertension. Then what is STMA? This is actually a new test. You're not new, actually. In almost two, three years we are using it. So it's a symmetric dimethyl arginine. It's a methylated arginine amino acid. It's derived from the intranuclear methylation of arginine, and it is released after proteolysis into the bloodstream, and it gets excreted as such through the kidneys. Like creatinine, it is getting excreted as such. But what is the advantage of STMA over to creatinine? Why it is better than creatinine? STMA more accurately reflects GFR in dogs. Even with 25% of renal fibrosis, it gets elevated. That means it's a very early detector compared to creatinine, which requires at least 75% of fibrosis. STMA is not affected by your lean body mass. Therefore, in a patient where there is emaciation, even with that, you can do STMA. Creatinine will get changed with the exercise. So revised staging in 2019, again done by IRIS. This is the revised staging. Now, mild uh, changes are done for creatinine. Between 1.4 2.8 is considered as stage 2. And 2.9 to 5 is stage 3. Above 5 is stage 4. So when you have to diagnose the disease, at least before stage 2, you have to diagnose it. 
It is too late when you are diagnosing at stage 3 or stage 4. You have less time to do your manipulations, okay. So once uh, you diagnose it, you don't blindly stage it based on creatinine stage. First check the hydration. If the hydration of the patient is okay, then you stage it. If it is dehydrated because of the signs of uh, kidney disease, you hydrate the patient and then you check the creatinine level and then you do the staging. That is the correct way, okay. So this is how you stage it. Stage 1, non-proteinuric, normotensive. These are examples. Borderline proteinuric, prehypertensive. Stage 2, proteinuric, prehypertensive. So why you stage that? Based on that only, you're going to do a treatment approach, okay. Okay, so you all know there is anemia and chronic kidney disease, yes? So what is the reasons behind that? Lack of erythropoietin, as simple as that. But apart from erythropoietin, some other reasons are there. One is, if you are frequently sampling also, it can cause, if it has a GI bleeding, if you are frequently doing hemodialysis, which is not a concern for us, because we, not, we don't frequently do it. So, and also, the uremia will suppress the bone marrow, and there will be an inflammation that can also suppress the bone marrow. Deficiency of vitamins, iron deficiency, all can be the reasons for anemia and CKD. How to treat anemia? <clears throat> what drug you are using? Darvipotin. The whole world knows by this time. Okay. Hyperglycosylated synthetic recombinant human erythropoietin analog darvipoietin at the dose rate of 0.8 microgram per kg weekly subcutaneously. Okay. Right? Okay. Now I feel it is 8 having 8 hemoglobin. After 6 weeks of treatment it went to 14. Then how to proceed? Do we stop darbipoidin or still you have to continue? And again, it'll recur, no? So for maintenance, you have to give every 21 days. What? See, weekly shots to reach the normal level. So after that, for maintenance, you have to give every 21 days. Maybe every month you can have it. Yes, you can take that leniency, okay? Because it's very costly, no? That way. Of course, so you, when you are using darbipoidin, there is no point in uh, doing it without iron supplementation because you are inducing appetite, not feeding means not going to gain weight. The same way, you have to give oral iron supplements, ferrous sulfate or any parenteral iron sucrose you can give. Okay. If it is very anemic, if it is not tolerating oral iron, okay. And also, these vitamins you have to supplement. So, along with Derby Point. Okay. What is the advantage of Derby Point in or? Upoitin earlier we are using. So it's a three, it's having a three, four longer half-life, allowing for less frequent dosing. That one have to be done at least three, three times a week. But this one you do once a week, it's fine. And side effects like hypertension, hyperkalemia, thrombocytosis, seizures are very minimal compared to upoitin. Whereas you know that pure red cell aplasia causing anemia, it's reported to be six percent with darbipoitin. Whereas that is about thirty percent with Upoitin. So, best option available right now is darbipoitin. Don't use epoitin. That's my advice, okay? We are regularly using without any issues. Okay, that is about anemia and chronic kidney disease. So, you should know why there is a proteinuria in CKD. So, it is the abnormal handling of normal plasma proteins by the kidney, by the glomerular apparatus. What happens? The glomerular apparatus is losing some structure and lose the perm selectivity. The anion cation differentiation is not done. Oh, I have to come in. I'm sorry. Okay. That, that side I can go? No. This is very close to me. That's why I'm going away. Okay. I'll use this. So altered perm selectivity of the basement membrane. You see, it cannot do the perm selectivity differentiation. So the, the proteins are lost through glomer filter. Okay. It is lost means it can recover, no? That recovery is also not possible. Impaired tubal recovery of plasma proteins that are normally found in the glomerular filtrate. Number three, exudation of protein into the interstitial space, into the urinary space. So everything is contributing to proteinuria. The filter is not doing properly, your reabsorption is not happening, and there is some exudation from the interstitial space happening there. So all these things will lead to proteinuria. So what is the impact of proteinuria? Let it have. You will have only protein loss. You can supplement it and you can balance that, no? What is the reason? If it's a negative prognostic indicator, if 
the proteinuria is UPC is greater than 1, it is associated with threefold greater risk of developing acetemia very quickly. That is why you have to control proteinuria. It will further lead to fibrosis. If the animal is proteinuric, it will further lead to fibrosis. Okay, right. So, why creatinine need to be measured with protein? Just uh, alone you can quantify protein, no? The reason is, creatinine is a byproduct of muscle metabolism and it is excreted approximately at a constant rate in the urine. The dehydration does not alter creatinine level. So, when you combine with urine creatinine, any fluctuation in the hydration status can be equalized. So that is why you do a UPC, not protein alone. UPC should be performed only on urine free of blood and inflammatory cells. First, you should see that it is not having any cystitis, any lesion in the bladder. That is a way you have to do it. You confirm it. If it is having a, a normal urine, but still it is proteinuric, then you can proceed for UPC. So, a complete say, urine analysis sediment evaluation should be completed to determine the, the sample is suitable for UPC. So, how proteinuria is treated? Again, it is by renin-angiotensin-aldosterone inhibition. As we do for heart failure, no? you have to do the same here. We have to use ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers. Okay. So, once you use this, it will do some repair in the glomerular apparatus. That is what happening. That is how it reduces proteinuria. And it reduces the size of uh, capillary endothelial pores also. Inhibits bradykinin. So, all those things happens with RAS inhibition. What is the drug of choice? You have to administer AC inhibitors. What commonly ACP inhibitors we use? Enalapril and Benesapril. That's the most commonly available. So you can use either Enalapril or Benesapril. Okay. And apart from that, you have to uh, feed a renal diet. Why? Okay. Uh, is it not low protein diet? Uh, okay. So combine AC inhibitors and diet. Still it's not working. You have to combine angiotensin receptor blockers. What commonly we use is telmisartan. Telmisartan is available in the market. Okay. Once I am discussing about the hypertension, I will tell you. If still proteinuria persists, even so, see uh, normally what we do, you use AC inhibitors you use double dose of AC inhibitors, then you combine with the angiotensin receptor blockers. If nothing works, then you have to go for renal biopsy. This is where it's indicated. Okay, that is about proteinuria. How to treat proteinuria is as simple as you have to use AC inhibitors or a combination of AC inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. So thromboembolism is another common problem with CKD. Okay, why there is thromboembolism? Almost 25% is there, incidence. But we are not at all treating for thromboembolism. Do anybody treat for thromboembolism in CKD? So what is the mechanism? So there are certain procoagulants and anticoagulants in the system. So procoagulants will clot. The anticoagulants will? OK. So this antithrombin and albumin, it's a procoagulant. OK. Procoagulant or anticoagulant? It's an anticoagulant, okay? So increase in plasma procoagulant, like other factors, because this is decreasing. Which one? The antithrombin. In fact, albumin is decreasing. It's an anticoagulant. So procoagulants will dominate and will cause thrombosis. That is how thromboembolism is happening, okay? So what is the reason behind any thrombosis? You all know that one is the the hypercoagulability. The other one is because of the difference in the procoagulant and anticoagulant. The other one is stasis. The other one is the epithelial damage. These three put together only, it causes thromboembolism. That's called virtuous triad. So how to prevent it? If the serum albumin level decreases below 2 gram per deciliter, you use either low acetyl salicylic, low dose of acetyl salicylic acid at 1 to 2 milligram per kg body once daily. Or you go with clopidogrel. Every 24 hours, clopidogrel, 1 to 3 milligram per kg. Okay, that is about thromboembolism. 
What is the mechanism behind hypertension in CKD? Why there is hypertension? So exact mechanism still they haven't elucidated, but it is the scarring of glomerular capillaries and arteriolar, uh, capillaries and arteriolar regions. The activation of RA secondary to impaired storium excretion and excessive renin secretion. Incre this is actually activation of RAs. So all these things will contribute to hypertension. Okay. So how will you measure blood pressure in dogs? Doppler. Why we are using Doppler? Why not a regular sigma manometer? Why we are not? Why you are using Doppler? Anyway, I'll answer that question. Just wait. So direct measurement, uh, it's not possible. That's a gold standard which you have to do and catheterization. That's a gold standard. It's not in human beings. They are not doing it. So only other thing is, next option is Doppler and osteometric devices. So Doppler is a poor estimator of diastolic blood pressure. So you have to depend on uh, Doppler only for systolic blood pressure. But oscillometric devices will measure the diastolic properly, but not the systolic. OK. So this is a, what device it is? Wet Dopp. It's a Doppler device. This one? It's a pet map. It's a oscillometric device. OK, two, two types are there. You can use it. OK. So how to measure BP? You, you see that the correct cough sound are inaudible in dogs. See, what they do in human beings, they do a coughing and then rise it and then they auscultate, no? That auscultation cannot be done. That is called correct cough sound, which is not heard in dogs. To hear that only, we are using Doppler, OK? So ultrasound gel is placed and uh, distilled to the cuff over the artery, and then a characteristic pulsatile flow will be there, sound you will hear, then you inflate it, sound will be uh, gone, and you deflate it, so the first sound, which is the systolic blood pressure. You all know this, you are regularly doing it. How you manage hypertension? So you cannot declare a patient by doing one measurements. You have to consistently do at least three to four occasions to declare as hypertensive patient because it will be very anxious when it comes to the clinic. So you have to do multi at least four to five readings you take to make sure that it is high. Okay. How hypertension is managed? You use AC inhibitors at a standard dose rate. What is the dose rate of enolapril malleate? 0.5 milligram per kg body, BID. Benesipril, although almost same dose, 0.5 to, uh, 0.25 to 0.5. You can reach up to even 2 milligram. That's not an issue. Okay. So if with that dose, it is not getting controlled, then you go with a double dose of AC inhibitors. Still, you don't control the blood pressure. Maybe you can do it after a week or two weeks. You can give time, then redo it. Still, it is not effective. You can combine a calcium channel blocker. You are preferring amylodipine because the action is on the vasculages. Diltiazem is it's more effective on the heart. It is an antiarrhythmic agent, not as an antihypertensive. I told you very clearly when I did. Okay, if that is not working, you combine AC inhibitors with your uh, angiotensin receptor blockers. Tell me, Sata you can use. OK, that is about uh, hypertension. I have time, I think so. What is the reason for hyperpasphyremia and CKD? So phosphorus is related to glomerular filtration days. Whenever the glomerular filtration it goes down, phosphorus level increases, as simple as that. It, it retains in the system. So once the pastorous level is increased, it will stimulate the parathyroid glands. That is the reason behind secondary renal parathyroidism. It starts with decreased GFR. How it is treated, hyperpastemia? Use prescription renal diet, which is a low pastorous diet. You use pastorate binders. It forms a non-absorbable complex along with the diet from GI tract. So these are the common binders we use. You can use aluminum hydroxide, preferably. Then comes your other things. Okay. 
So what does the pathogenesis begin in secondary renal hypothyroidism? When there is a CKD, there will be reduction in GFR and reduction in the nephrons, and there will be increase in phosphate retention that lead to decreased calcium level, so the parathormone is stimulated. Increased levels of parathormone. The parathyroid gland is stimulated. The other way, number of renal tubules, tubular cells will decrease, so there will be reduction in the synthesis of calcitriol, so there will be reduction in the calcium absorption in the gut. So again, and lack of negative feedback, both will contribute to the increase in parathormone. This is our secondary renal hyperparathyroidism sets in. Okay. So what are the clinical signs? Fibrous osteodystrophy. Radiographs will reveal your, uh, the teeth and all, it will lose its density. Bone also loses its density. And uh, you have a mandibular maxillary swelling. It's rubber jaw syndrome, we call it as. And pathological factors are very common. So whenever the serum calcium level, I mean the product, that is a multiplication of calcium level and phosphorus concentration exceeds 60 to 70. For example, if the calcium level is 10 and your phosphorus level is 7, what is the product? 70. So if it exceeds, you will have soft tissue mineralization. You have to understand that, okay. There will be a bone marrow suppression, and there will be urolithiasis. The neuropathy can also happen with this of secondary renal hyperparathyroidism. So how will you diagnose this? So you do a serum phosphorus level, it will be high, naturally. You do a serum parathormone level, it should be high. Where you do it? In a human lab, they do parathormone level. You don't have a problem. But if you do a calcium level, it can be normal to high or even low. So serum ionized calcium even would be normal to high. And calcitriol also the same. So which are two reliable one is your phosphorus and parathormone levels. That will reflect whether it's having a hyperparathyroidism. How to treat that? You do a phosphorus restricted diet again. You use phosphate binders and use calcitriol. When you're using calcitriol, you have to keep monitoring the calcium levels very carefully, and also creatinine levels. Tablet form is available, you can use. This isn't available still. That's a vitamin D analog. Calcitriol is available, you can use it. And keep monitoring those levels regularly. Okay. This, I'll quickly skip this part, because, of course, the size of the kidney, plus the nephroliths for hydronephrosis, renal calcification, all those things you can do with X-ray. Okay. How much time I have, sir? 15 minutes? 15 minutes I have. So what is this picture, what it says? This one? I put the, on the lesion. It's a severe hydronephrosis. Okay, you can see two views are there. And this picture? This one? Nephroliths, you know that. This one, last one. Now this is mainly the renal calcification. I don't know, I'll put the cursor over there and show you. Do you see that? I'll enlarge it. You see that, that's renal calcification. Of course, so I considered a USG even before STMA to detect a chronic kidney disease. So ultrasound will reveal even before your STMA shows, if you are very confident doing it. And uh, you can do size with that. You can do the architecture with that. The normal, the, the length of the kidney to iota ratio should be 5.5 to 9.1. Anything falls below that, we call it as a contracted. And above that is enlarged. But most of the time, most of the kidneys fall within 5.5 to 9.1. So there is no point in assessing the size. So you have to assess the architecture, how it is. Mainly the lesions are seen in the cortex. A thickened cortex, a punctated or a diffuse fibrosis of cortex, Irregular contour, all those things will tell you. You can do a ureteral calculate with this. Ureteral dilatation, hydronephrosis, all this thing can do with this. So these are some of the pictures. The first one shows how dissimilar the kidneys are in a patient. And the second one, that's a renal tumor. And this one is a hydronephrosis. And this is a fibrous kidney. You know that, huh? It's a very... It's very obvious fibrosis. So you don't make 
mistakes with this. And this one? Anybody? Nephrolith, okay? It's a pug. Pugs, most of the time I see nephroliths in pugs only. The same pug. That's a renal tumor. Just I'm telling you what advantage ultrasound has in assessing the renal. That's a renal tumor, okay. That's a CKD, fibrous kidney. It's a four months old grade day. Okay, that is about the role of uh, X-ray and ultrasound in chronic kidney disease. Coming to the enteric dialysis, it's a non-renal method of excreting urea from the body. To promote, diet should be supplemented with fermentable fibers such as beet pulp, FOS, and gum arabica. These are needed. So imagine without that, you want to take? I'll, okay. So imagine the, that the process is without the fermental fiber. Okay. You are just giving a, a normal diet without FOS. So what actually happens? See, normally a small amount of urea is transported to the colonic blood supply, and that urea is present to the gut's lumen. Blood supply, urea reaches, and it's present to the lumen. In the lumen, the intestinal bacteria hydrolyze urea into ammonia by producing urease enzyme. This ammonia is subsequently in incorporated in the bacterial protein, and it's excreted from the animal's body. This is how enteric dialysis happens. So what you are trying to do with this, you are trying to enhance this process, that's all. How you enhance it? You are increasing the colonic blood supply by using all those this, uh, FOS and all. And also, you are making the better environment in the gut for the microbes to act. Okay. So, with the fermentable fiber, what happens? You actually see. So, a lot of short chain fatty acids are produced, and bacterial number increases. Health of the colonic mucosa surface improves. So, more blood supply to the colon, and more urea will be presented to the intestinal tract. So increased bacterial proliferation maintains the urea, allowing it to have a continuous blood flow. And once uh, more urea into the system, the bacteria will convert into ammonia, and ammonia is incorporated to the bacterial protein, and the bacteria is excreted out. This is how it happens. Okay. Okay. That is about enteric dialysing agent uh, agents. A typical renal diet, it should have a pastoralist restriction. Low protein, it's a controversial one. If you are using all this enteric dialysis agent, why you need to go for a low protein diet? It's all added. FO is all added in the renal diet, okay? Still, it's a controversial, but still we maintain low protein diet only. What is the protein percentage in the renal diet? Anybody? What is the normal protein percentage? Range, you tell me. Around 20 to 25 in that range. And what about renal? It's half of it, okay? It's a sodium-restricted diet. It's a potassium-restricted diet. It's an alkalizing diet. Whenever it reaches beyond stage three, you will have metabolic acidosis. So you need an alkalizing agent to be added to it, like soda bicarb. So vitamin B complex added. Omega-3 fatty acid is added. And FOS and beet pulp. This is for enteric dialysis. This is how a classical a renal, typical renal diet should be. And a typical renal diet should have this. This is an AFCO minimum. And this is all what most of the therapeutic renal diets have. So based on this, you can do your homemade renal diets. OK, how much protein is needed and how much is phosphorus needed, you know. So you can collect the ration, you can do it. How to do it? Choose the ingredients. Find the calories, potash, uh, phosphorus, potassium, sodium, and protein levels of the chosen ingredients. Work out the caloric requirement. What is the caloric requirement for a renal patient? It is one point. 1 to 1.3 times of the RER. So you should have got the RER, and then you, you, you almost do 1.2 times of RER, you will get the record caloric requirement. Once you have uh, 1.6 times, OK. So apply the minimum AFCO standards to the diet for every 1,000 kilocalories. Mainly, you decide on phosphorus and protein. Don't bother about others. It won't exceed. Just work out the proper protein levels and the phosphorus level and the caloric requirement, you can arrive at it. It's not so complex about it. OK. Add some uh, fish oil, prebiotic like FOS. OK. So generally, 
when a renal patient is presented to you, first thing, you do a blood pressure measurement, you do a CBC with reticulocyte count. Why reticulocyte count? It's a reversible or reversible. Zero biochemistry with electrolytes and acid base, urine analysis with UPC, urine culture sensitivity, urinary system imaging. These are the things you generally do, and uh, <coughs> you will have your results there. So based on this, you can declare. General treatment protocol, discontinue all potentially nephrotoxic drugs, if possible. Identify and treat renal and pre-renal causes. Sorry, pre-renal and post-renal causes. Manage dehydration, this is an important part. Manage, you allow it to have a surplus water when you find it is having a, a chronic kidney disease. Treat metabolic acidosis. Treat GI complications. Start a renal diet. Manage hypertension. Manage proteinuria. Manage hyperpositemia. Treat anemia. So these are the things you commonly do. Anything I'm missing here? Manage thromboembolism if the albumin level goes below 2. Manage secondary renal hyperparathyroidism. Okay, this is the treatment guidelines you have to follow it. You can see that. So everything for the first line, second line, what to be done, it is there based on the guidelines from the iris. So you, for an example, you take stage 4. See the pastoralist level? It should be at least below 6. No need to go up to 4.5. You should maintain at least below 6. Okay. That you have to. And UPC, it's constantly, it should be below 0.5. Because proteinuria will further cause fibrosis. Thank you. Any questions? Huh? 0.25 to 0.5 milligram. Yeah, I know that. 0.25 to 0.5 milligram per kg, once in, a, once in a day. So 0.5 you take, 30 kg means it comes to 15. No, you have to do that way because we don't have veterinary options for that. You have to do that only. Any more questions? Thanks, Dr. Jairaja. Thank you, sir. And uh, now we have uh, sponsor times for three sponsors, followed by our president, Dr. Venkatesh, will give a lecture on the surgic, uh, decision making in the surgical intervention of lower urinary tract lithiasis in male dogs. Uh, so please, all of you, wait. Now, the sponsor's time. I request uh, Himalaya. Just me a few seconds, guys. Introduce myself. I'm Dr. Adash. I'm a brand manager in Himalaya. Right now, I'm looking after canine segment. And uh, you know, I was actually sitting there down there, and I was actually seeing the uh, seeing this podium where it was written compassion, ethics, and knowledge. That's the main reason why we are here, right? So all of us are here because of that. So let me tell a story very quickly because I've given only 10 minutes time. So. Um, 
Just give me a second. Perfect. So, how an elephant helped someone uh, to, you know, what do you say, make a business of 8,000 crores a year, right? It all started in Burma when some person was traveling to the Burma and in Burma what happens? So, elephant was actually overworked, right? So, usually uh, this was in 1920s. That was the only means in the deep in the jungles where you can do that, right? So, uh, the person actually saw someone who's actually working on those lines, uh, you know, the person who's actually doing all these things was giving, given, giving some roots to that elephant so that it's, no, you know, the, the nerves will calm down for the uh, elephant. So, that's the reason, uh, you know, why actually this company started, right? So, yes, that's how actually, uh, that's how actually Himalaya company started. The root is uh, Serpentina. So, Sarpaganda we say in the local language, right? So, that's how actually Himalaya started. So, there is nothing, there is nothing called mistakes. There are sweet accidents. So, with an accident actually uh, came up, uh, uh, you know what you say, an Indian made company made for global now, right? So, that's how we actually started our business. And yes, when we talk about Himalaya, we are present in more than 100 countries right now. So, I think you would have used Himalaya product at some point of your life, right? We are having all the CPD products, oral care, face care. Uh, we are in beauty products for, you know, uh, we have air products. Like that, we have animal health division. In that animal health division, uh, a small sector, you know, the small section is our companion animal business. So, of course, as I said, uh, you would also used our products in some, uh, some part of your life. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for growing our category big as that today and uh, when we talk about our range little bit I just uh, brush it up so uh, we have wellness range we have grooming range uh, we have nutrition range so in wellness range uh, of course we have leaf 52 uh, we have Ferglow, we have Imcal, we have Immunol, we have Impirin and one uh, one basic uh, drug which we are actually selling is Digital so these are the basic products which we have in uh, wellness range and again, I thank everyone who is present here, not present here, uh, to make this wellness brand as, uh, as big as it today, right? And when we come to, come to grooming range, of course, uh, when it comes to grooming range, uh, thanks to you, we are the market leaders. So, we have a good uh, range of products there. We have Arena, Arena Plus, uh, we have, uh, you know, EP, which is for ectoparasites and so on. And when we come to nutrition range, yes, we are picking up in nutrition range. Uh, we should understand we have the pharma company who are actually uh, betting on nutrition range, right? So, right now we have nutrition, in nutrition range we have a basic food and treats, right? So, in, in food we have already have a variant called chicken and rice and milk and dry, rice. And in treats, again thanks to you guys, treats is, uh, we are number two players in India in treats, especially in uh, uh, biscuit category. Uh, we are actually coming up with new, uh, new, new treats as well, as soon as possible. But uh, today, um, we'll talk about a little bit of our nutrition range because I'm a brand manager for nutrition range. Uh, yes, uh, we are actually launching new products in puppy and as well as in adult. It's called chicken and milk in puppy, chicken and pumpkin in uh, adult. And I request SAPAC members to come on the stage and release that new, I mean, uh, unveil that uh, uh, new products for us. Please, sir. And also, I request uh, Dr. Choklingam, our sales manager from Himalaya. Sao is looking after Sao. And uh, Mr. Manikandan is looking after our zone. Welcome, sir. Please. Happiness is the reflection of healthy life. Healthy life is the reflection of healthy food. Thank you for embracing health and happiness into your pet's life with Himalayan Healthy Pet Food. Together, we have come this far, and your support has been invaluable. Adding more happiness to your pet's happy life. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
Himalaya Wellness Company is introducing new flavors so in the much, product guys. lineup. Thank you so Healthy much. Pet Food, and, a complete uh, and balanced food for dogs. Healthy Pet Food, Chicken and, and Milk, for Puppy, enriched with the goodness of milk and herbs, which contribute to your puppies. Uh, okay. So, when we see the puppy food, it's chicken and milk. It's most, I mean, most commonly sold, uh, you know, food in the puppy category. And we are, you know, as an Himalayan, I'm entering, I mean, we are entering into this category. And I, I hope everyone here, who's from Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Andhra, and other parts of India support us. And, uh, you know, as we say, as we speak, in adult category, we are actually launching chicken and pumpkin. And uh, all you guys already know pumpkin is a super food. Um, I'm actually, you know, uh, hoping you'll also like it and you prescribe it to uh, the pet parents. And uh, that's all from my side. I thank every member of SAPAC uh, all the members who are actually present here, thank you uh, from my bottom of my heart and uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity, sir. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of your time. Yes. Thanks, Himalaya team. Uh, next is Taswet. Taswet, are you ready? Now it is Well, uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, initially, let me introduce myself. I am Dr. Vayusen Thorat. I did my MVSC from Nagpur Veterinary College. Uh, basically, for first one year, I did private practice. Then I have joined this pharma industry. And since last 20 years, I am working in this pharma industry. So I have started this industry as a sales promoter. And now I am working as a general manager in Toswet Pharmaceutical Limited. So basically, yes, it is a new launch company. Just three months back, we have launched our products. But it's not a just new one, one more company in the industry or just a new company which added in the pet industry. It's basically, it's a uh, different and unique company. Why? Because I'll ask you how many companies working in the veterinary industry are having their own manufacturing facility 
which are dedicated to the veterinary industry. I think, I think very few, very few of them. So proudly, I can tell you that Tosweight is the company which has got world-class manufacturing facility, which is located in Solapur, Maharashtra. That is four hours away from Pune. And we got our own R&D team. We got uh, our mentor and director, Dr. Ramesh Mapari. So he's having a long experience of 25 years. He got 10 to 12 patents on his own name. He has worked for Sun Pharma, Glaxo, and Pfizer, all major MNC companies. So he is a head of our R&D team. So it's a new company which entered in the market to make a difference. So and in initial phase, we got 30 plus products now in our basket. And we have covered almost all the A town as well as B towns, which are important from the aspect of pit industry particularly. So uh, just uh, roam through our product range. We got something unique actually, though few products might be similar, but we got something new and even few new products also. Means new do either new doses form or new combinations. So let's go one by one. So this is YKTM syrup, specially customized for cats. And this is meant for, uh, this is particularly meant for cat only. Sorry, wait to come here. So vitamin, mineral, and all amino acids are there. Next, we'll just, I'll not take much time actually. We got Himoto syrup. So see, uh, we got uh, either RBC boosters or platelet boosters in the market. So we got combination of both. This Tinospora cordifolia as well as papaya extract along with cobalt vitamin B12, copper, and folic acid as well. So uh, this you can use in anemia as well as as a platelet booster. And in all viral infections also you can go for this. Next. Then we got Vitos M again uh, in dog form for puppies for uh, overall growth and vitality as well as for immunity boosting purpose. Next. Huh. So, yeah. Togest. So this is again herbal combination for any uh, digestive disturbances as well as as an appetizer you can go for this Togez drop. Then Evitos M. Basically, see in the uh, for the birds there are very few products and the, those two of branded company there are very few products. So we got Evitos M. You can use it as a vitamin mineral supplement as well as we have added omega 3 and omega 6 in it. So for the feather quality also, you can go for this product. Then for uh, immunity boosting, toss well or uh, toss mean oral, and that is in a spray form, easy to use. Sepotos, we have launched this Sepotos dry syrup. It is extremely palatable. Uh, we got strawberry flavor in it. Then vomitos, ah, this is specially uh, uh, made dewormer for cats, combination of prosequantal as well as parental. In cat, generally, febantal is not needed as there are no, uh, as in cats particularly, we don't go for febantal as there is no uh, incidence of weep worms in cats particularly. So febantal is not needed. We have added only prosequantal as well as parental. For dogs also, we got vermitos oral suspension. Then Melotos, it is again uh, highly palatable in suspension form. We got calcium uh, that is of oyster shell source. So in veterinary industry, hardly anyone has got this source. It is highly bioavailable. Bio so uh, brand name is Toscal Pet. Then again, we got Vitos M syrup for dogs. Uh, earlier was for cats. This. This is very good product actually, Tolu plus syrup. You can find the, uh, you can see the combination actually. We have added fresh liver extract along with various herbs and particularly we have added Silibum Marina. So you will see a uh, few products in the market which is having Silibum Marina, but see the difference. Basically when you extract milk thistle plant, 
it will, the extract is called as silymarin. But that silymarin, again, it is having silibin, silicristin, silidianin, and isocilibin. So, initially, you have to ensure that in that milk thistle extract, there should be minimum 80% silymarin. And in that silymarin, there should be 30% silibin, which is most active component of it. And we have ensured it. Then we got Megatos syrup. Particularly here also, you will find a unique combination. We have added salmon oil, which we have specially imported uh, from Norway. It is made up of Norwegian salmon, which is having a high, highest bioavailability. And here is the blend of omega-3, omega-6 plus salmon oil. So, uh, special international emulsion technology is used for this product, Megatos. You can see the combination. Yes. Again, one more product, Flexitos. So here, few of the in ingredients like glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, MSM, you will find in uh, every other products. But if you find this EPA as well as DHA, which is very useful in joint health, we have specially So EPA and DH is added, all vitamins are added in it, and we have specially used low molecular weight chondroitin sulfate. Otherwise, chondroitin sulfate has got around 24% bioavailability. So you should go for low molecular weight chondroitin sulfate. We have ensured it. Next. Nervitos. So this is now tonic actually, Nervitos. This again, this is unique combination, ITTOS. You, you can find ofloxacin along with ornidazole is there, itraconazole is there, and clobetazole. So, this is again unique combination for skin care. Then we got cephodoxin tablets, 200 mg as well as 100 mg. It is having better palatability. Then itraconazole in a capsule form. So uh, researchers have found that it should be given in a capsule form particularly rather than tablet form. So we have launched itraconazole in a capsule form. It is again ITTOS 200 as well as 100. Then amoxicillin plus potassium chlorinate combination 250 mg, 500 mg. This is one unique doses form. We have got imitos actually. So undan cetron in a strip form. You have to just put the strip on the tongue of the dog. He, he would not be able to remove it. And it will be disintegrating within 5 to 10 seconds. So quite easy to administer and quite useful. Imitos 2 mg strips are there. And soon we will be launching it in a 4 mg strip. Also. We got... Uh, grooming range of shampoos, Valtado uh, dog, Bio Vera, especially made for cat actually, Bio Vera cat. Then we have got foam bath also, dry bath. This new molecule, first time in veterinary industry, we have launched Cytaconazole. So nowadays, most of the antifungal agents, they have got resistance due to higher uses. So we have launched Cytaconazole along with the along with the combination of zinc pyrethon. And this is very useful in fungal infections, eczema, as well as particularly in seborrhea cases, you can go for this. Brand is Cetos beer. Then recently we have launched winning foods, Toslac feline, especially made for cats, as well as Toslac dog. And we have got few more products in our pipeline. Those are very unique. We'll be launching those soon. So, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And I will not forget to mention that I have attended so many events since last 20 years in the industry. But this is one of the best events, very well organized. Uh, so, thanks to organizers also. And uh, thanks for giving me an opportunity to be present in front of all of you. Uh, very wonderful as well as very knowledgeable people. Thank you. Thanks a lot.
Thank you, TOSFET team. And next is Mankind. Dr. Piyush. And the sound is sufficient. Audio. Hello. Hello. In Mankind, we have a tradition to start anything uh, by uh, Mankind Anthem.
மேன்கைண்ட் ஃபார்மா உள்ளத்தால் சுதேசி உயிரால் இந்தியன் ட்ரெய்னிங் இஸ் ஸ்ட்ராட்டஜிக் Good evening doctors I am Dr Swati Jaiswal taking care of marketing and the technical part of mankind pet star so um actually I know it's very tiring and the informative day at the same time but I need your full attention uh, because at the end of the session uh, we have some surprise gift for five participant it's like we will do one quiz session and five uh, will get the chance to bid that uh, prize so uh, firstly i want to shortly brief you about mankind so uh, we are in man uh, mankind is the fourth largest pharma company in indian pharma market and in terms of prescription writing we are in the first position it's like 4 lakh plus doc human doctors are associated with the mankind and in terms of distribution we are having a second position and we are uh, we are having at 14000 plus uh, field force 11000 plus stockist and 700 plus scientist uh, unit in r and d in canine segment we have a two division uh, one is pet uh, pet mankind for the pharma and other is uh, pet nutrition so in pet mankind our new launches are ferrikine pet syrup new force pet spray and cifa star cv so recently we have entered into the pet food category and we have launched our uh, new brand that is mankind pet star so uh, first i want to show you our factory video where our uh, food is manufacturing so it's our a uh, tv commercial uh, for the, our pet star brand awareness ranveer rocko breakfast ready yes oh you need to do that that is work to the beat please you got to put your hands on your knees हेलो या हाउ आर जर्नी स्टार्टेड Uh, you have seen that we are manufacturing in the United Kingdom, but why we have chose United Kingdom only? So uh, when we decided into the and enter into the pet food category, it came from genuine concern that is quality food, and we explored best OEM manufacturer globally, uh, and after a lot of research, shortlisted Europe as a sourcing location because of the whales. It's like because uh, if I will say a quality, uh, quality means. in pet food quality means two things it's like best quality ingredient and other is manufacturing so that's why we have chose whales in united kingdom because of their uh, good quality european grade hu uh, human quality raw materials and modernized manufacturing unit so this is our manufacturing unit video Step into a kaleidoscope of greenery with scene-stealing views of Wales in the United Kingdom. Some of the most spellbinding terrains in the whole of Britain. This place has a catalogue of quintessential green and natural vegetation, which offers multitudes of high-quality natural produce. Nestled between these enchanting grasslands in nature's lap is the place which produces the world's finest and delectable pet food. for your pets presenting pet star a new pet food brand offering an array of specialized formulations which are highly palatable nutritious healthy and most importantly 
incorporating ancient Ayurveda care principles of food science. We are more than just animal health science experts. Combining the best of natural ingredients to create premium pet food formulations for your pets. With a focus on quality, palatability and nutrition, Pet Star makes it easy to choose the healthiest possible diet for our pets. Along with building a future of canine wellness. At our beautiful facility in Wales, we procure the finest quality raw materials and process them adhering to stringent quality norms that provide richer nutrient values in our final products. The high standard and provenance of UK meat is known throughout the world and at Petstar we use only the finest of this Welsh produce. The most significant part of sourcing our protein is procuring cage-free chicken and lamb, which is raised in these natural grass-based production systems. We procure 20 essential nutritious ingredients from UK's best suppliers that are premium in quality, palatable and nutritious for your pets, supporting their growing bones, muscles, immunity, digestion and overall health. We follow global manufacturing standards for handling and storage of raw materials, which are as per GMP HACCP global guidelines. Each raw material is dosed precisely as per the recipe formulations through an automated dosing system. Adhering to PetStar's multi-level quality checks to achieve a high quality and standardized product, we leave no stone unturned to create the best dry pet food for your pets. We use world-class extrusion, drying and specialized coating technology from global reputed manufacturing units which deliver premium, palatable and nutritious food for your pets. PetStar's end-to-end production line from grinding, extrusion, coating to packaging is maintained in a controlled environment which is hygienic and food safe. The product undergoes an untouched manufacturing process till packaging complying to European pet food standards. Our teams ensure every kibble which comes out is a perfect blend of quality, food safety, nutrition and palatability. PetStar is made by unique recipes designed by an eminent nutritionist which are suitable and stable for Indian conditions. Taste profiles meet the European quality protocols to provide every pet parent an experience. Precise and thermally sanitized kibbles every time. The process is highly automated to maintain uniform nutritional quality and taste in each kibble. During our production and post-production processes, we perform multiple quality checks to verify against any enlisted production specifications. We deploy bacteria-resistant storage facilities for our finished product till the packaging is complete. Pets are highly sensitive to smell, hence all our packs come with a special Velcro seal from Japan and metallic laid laminates to retain freshness in every meal served to your pets. At PetStar, our focus is all about your pet's health and happiness. Understanding the needs of modern pets' biological and optimal nutritional needs, our products adhere to AFCO and FEDIAF EU norms. Further too, our teams interacted with hundreds of pet parents by which we formulated customized formulations for different age groups and specialized breeds. Sourcing the best raw materials as per European standards, every pet star kibble is enriched with the power of ashwagandha and silibum, which protects liver, kidney and boosts immunity in your adorable pets. The Welsh region in the United Kingdom prides itself in providing highest quality of fresh and natural produce. Our pet star, with our impeccable facility and a unique supply chain model, we strive to provide the same European standard experience to our customers in every pack. Special relationships are deserved to be cherished and enriched, such as the bond between pet parent and their pets. From the House of India's leading pharmaceutical company, Mankind Pharma, PetStar is a trusted product for your loved ones. Our teams are committed in creating the healthiest, palatable and the most nutritious food with the energy and vitality to really thrive for our pets. Our belief is that food that makes pets happy and healthy and we promise to give the best to your stars who are our pet stars. Pet star, yum food for your star pet.
pets with the added advantage of ashwagandha and silly bump. So uh, mankind is here for a long term and it's like we have came up with the mission to become a most lovable, most palatable and the most healthy pet food brand for dogs and cat. We being from the pharma company focused only on science and the health of pets and the human. Uh, the product benefit we are providing in Petstar, we have used ashwagandha and silibum marianum. Reason behind using ashwagandha and silibum marianum, actually during the finalization of the recipe, we had done some anonymous survey among the vets that what are the most prevalent problem currently pet parent are facing. So we have uh, find out two problems. First is due to the change in lifestyle, dogs is getting too much stress. So that's why we have added ashwagandha in our food and second, and in adult stage, mostly dogs are getting liver and kidney diseases. So that's why we have added silibum marinum. So it will protect their liver and kidney. So in ashwagandha, along with the calming effects, it has the benefit of healthy immune system, uh, makes skin and coat shinier, and improve muscle strength. And silibum marinum protect liver and kidney. So uh, Petstar is a very palatable, uh, palatability wise, it is very excellent palatability because of good quality fat source. And uh, for the fat source, we have used rapeseed oil, linseed oil, and salmon oil. And it has very low peroxide value, which prevents rancidity of fat and improves stability of the kibbles. So in Petstar, uh, we have manufactured in very modernized manufacturing unit, providing an additional health benefit in food in t by ashwagandha and silibum marianum, having a very high quality ingredients. It's a power of 20 plus ingredient. And um, we are customization as per the Indian climatic condition. This is Petstar portfolio. So time for quiz. So it will be like um, those who will give first answer and the correct answer, we will give prize to them. It, it will be not in a chorus. <laughs> Need. Uh, Okay. Okay. It is manufac uh, manufacturing in UK. But what is the, you know, customization? Customization. Weather condition customization. Yeah. Manufacturing in United Kingdom, but uh, customization as per the Indian climatic condition. Why peroxide value is important in any pet food? Hand raise, hand, hand raise please. What, sir? Okay. Yes, sir. Correct answer. Uh, it's like... to prevent rancidity and to keep stability of kibbles. So, hmm? Name two mankind product which have silly marine. Please. Two mankind product. Hippa must end. Yeah, please give, give to ma'am. 
them. Ma'am, ma'am. In second row, Elumulai. Yeah. Why Ashwagandha is puppy and adult dog? <laughs> yeah. Why did sir have to decide which? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> sir, you have to decide. With whom we, we have to give this program? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is added in Pet Star for liver and kidney protection? Correct. Thank you. And uh, thank you for kind for your patience and active listener. And sir, just want every SEPEC. Board members to come here. Thank you, entire SAPAK team. Thank you, all doctors, for giving us this opportunity. We from mankind thank you, everyone here uh, present to support us. And we're looking forward for more support from you. Thank you. Sir, please. Yeah. Can we invite, sir? Thank you, Pet Mankind team. And uh, we have three announcements. Tomorrow, the session starts by 9 o'clock with Dr. Sri Devi on reducing the infant mortality. So I request you all to come to the hall by 8.45 a.m. And second thing, tomorrow, the checkout time is 10 a.m. So you have to come prepared. Probably you can even check your rooms and then come to the hall. And the third thing, feedback form is given in your file during the registration time. All of you fill up the form and then give it to the desk which will be there in the registration, near the registration, and get your certificates, and surprise gifts are also awaiting. So we need your feedback form with fully uh, written also, now, so that that will give us more opportunity to serve you in the future. So finally, we are coming to the, the last session by our president of SAPAC, Dr. J. Venkatesh, on decision making in the surgical intervention of lower urinary tract lithiasis in male dogs. Dr. Venkatesh. Hello. Where is this? This is the point. Front to back. Yes, sir. Okay, change it. Change it. Change it. Change it. Next, this is next year. This is previous. Okay, video on the video. 
So, <clears throat> very good evening. I will try to stick on to my time, 45 minutes. We are going to, this is not something that I wanted to present. I come from a very a pure practitioner. So, I see a lot of practitioners going through the same problem very often. We, in a week, we have so many referrals coming in from practitioners or uh, there are people who operate. So it is more than sufficient for us to go and operate on uh, uh, urolithiatic patients and canines. That doesn't require for you to go have your uh, masters in uh, veterinary surgery. So considering this, this is a surgery. If anybody who's capable of doing an abdominal surgery, the simplest thing is a neuter, I think you can perform these surgeries very well. So you need to just stick on to certain rules and guidelines. Now, before we start, I'm going to have these discussions. I'm going to walk you through certain case scenarios where decision making is something very, very important. So we need to take into consideration different forms of uh, different uh, variables before we hit a surgical decision. This is not new to you. So, so the topic here is on lower urinary tract. When we talk lower urinary tract, upper urinary tract, it is about the kidneys and the ureter. Lower urinary tract starts from the bladder, then you have the prosthetic urethra. Here I have this. This is the prosthetic urethra. Then you have the membranous urethra and the, pel uh, the penile urethra. So these are the major pathways where you have obstructions from the calculi. Now, this is just to show you how uh, you see you, you, you see these calculi. There's a cystic calculi on both these sides. And here, I think you have the, what is this urethra called? Penile urethra. So you have penile urethra, cystic calculi here, and also in the prosthetic urethra, you have the uh, calculi. It is just to give you an understanding. <clears throat> now, there are certain important aspects where we find uh, these stones form. So there are these variables. This is how it is happening. The first thing is high concentration of salts in the urine. Urine has a lot of salts. There are a very, very important uh, uh, few of them which is of clinical significance. So high concentration. Second, this high concentration should retain over a period time. So only then it starts to settle, okay? So the second thing is retention of these salts over a period. Now we find off late as we start having a lot of development. So there are a lot of flats, apartments coming in and toy breeds are now more preferred over the large bred dogs. So when you have large bred dogs, they are into the range, they have access to, they can drink a lot of water, they, they can go pee any time. But it, when it is in an apartment, that is when it has to depend on yourself. So you might take your dog once or twice or thrice. So three times or four times in a 24 hour period. So that is when you have a significant amount of retention of urine. And small breeds, they don't drink a lot of water. So and uh, moreover, there are a lot of dietary, like so many uh, new fa food industry has come in. So we have a hell of a lot of uh, products, dry products. So there are uh, certain things that happen inside. So you find that the urine is highly concentrated and it starts retaining over a period. Now, the third, the most important aspect of the entire, the etiology is the pH. So it is at certain pH, that critical pH, that these salts, they have a tendency to precipitate. So pH also plays a very important role. It is the only important role there. And these have to go and deposit on a scaffold. This scaffold can be a blood clot, it can be uh, desquamated cells, 
from the urothelium, anything can be there, but it has to form a nucleus. Only on the nucleus, you have the precipitation happening. So that is another thing. And you have, there are certain defense mechanism, inherent defense mechanisms in our body. They are, they try to inhibit these formations. One is the glycosamina glycan. And there are a few other things like your osteopontin and nephrocalcin, and of course your endogenous citrates. So they try to prevent stone formation. So as practitioners, we need to understand these things because we need to educate the client, try to manage the patient even if you're going to take this patient through surgery. Post-surgery, your management principles depend on understanding of all these things. One, concentration of the urine. Two, retention period, you understand the importance. pH is the very, very important aspect of your management. And of course, understanding that there are some uh, natural inhibitors. So, before we get into this, I just want to show the cross section of a urolith. See, the urolith here starts with this nidus inside. That's the nucleus. As we told, it's a scaffold on which you have the salts getting deposited. And then you have a body. That is the essence of the stone. That is the major component. And you might have the same component, or you might have a different uh, kind of a stone or a crystal forming the shell of the stone. And you have few other crystals sticking onto this. So understanding the dimension of a calculi rests with deciphering a stone analysis report. So stone analysis report, you don't take it by the merit of whatever you get. So usually they give calcium, phosphate, oxalate, cysteine, anything. You might get a clutter of all these together, but it is up to us to take into consideration other factors and then go ahead with uh, management. So this is the idea of how an idus happens in the body of the stone. So coming to this, what are the types of stones we encounter in practice? Oxalate, ah, stuvite, then urates, yeah, calcium salts, then silicates. Okay, good. So these are the common things. So calcium, calcium oxalates, then the stuvites, then the urate and xanthines. They are the purines, and you have the cysteine and the silicates. These are the major things which we encounter. You can have an exclusive calcium oxalate or a combination of this because as I told you, the previous slide you have seen how anidus forms and then you have the, uh, you might have a struvite nidus and you might have a calcium oxalate over that. So it is up to us to go and understand how these things are. So you might have to treat for stuvite, you might have to treat for calcium oxalate stones as well. So this is, I'm not going, getting into how the etiology of uh, stone formation, but this is a thing that I would want to just highlight and make you understand. You need to just keep this in mind. This chart, it is easy to understand. I've just added here the radiological visibility also as a, a marker. So most of the practices we have uh, the digital x-rays. So radiology becomes in principle a major component of our practice. So here, a struvite zone, struvite, how does struvite form? What is struvite? Ammonium phosphate. Okay, struvite, how does it form? See, the urinary pH, as I told, it forms, it is usually because of uh, a lot of uh, uh, bacterial infection happening in the uh, microenvironment that makes the pH of the urine more alkaline. So that's when this starts to precipitate. 
So here I try to give you the pH that's alkaline. Once this system hits an alkaline pH, then the tendency to develop is high. Development of white is high. And uh, you here have the radiological visibility that is variable. It is neither as bright as an oxalate calcium salts or as low or radiolucent as your cysteine, I mean, uh, your ammonium urate. So it is intermediate and variable, but some, you might get a faint shadow. So that understanding is important because once you understand that, as a clinician, when you try to do a, an, a, a, do a radiograph, these are certain variables that are going to tell you how to rule out certain kinds of stones. It's just a direction. It gives you a direction at what we are looking at. Then you're having the calcium oxalate. This usually have tries to precipitate in an uh, acidic environment. And here, there is no medical dissolution. It is only a surgical uh, removal. And maybe this one, radial visibility is very high, radio opaque. And ammonium urate, this is again acidic. And calculated diet and medications can be given. And it has varied, variable lucency. This can be almost insignificant. So you may have to have a double contrast to get something. And an ultrasound can pick up a, all these stones. So that is no problem if you have an ultrasound. And cysteine, again, acidic pH, it has variable opacity. Silicates. Silicates are only acidic, and surgical removal, there is no calculatic diet. It is highly opaque. So once you understand, see, of all, it is the struvite alone forms in the alkaline pH. All the others are in the acidic pH. So that, you keep it in mind. And uh, silicates and calcium oxalates, it's only surgical removal. And post-surgical, it is medical management, dietary management. And also try to attach yourself to the radiological visibility, which I've tried to give you. That will be really helpful. Now, coming to the goals of surgical intervention, there are two things. One, as a veterinarian, we would want to relieve the point of abstraction. The second one is we have to ensure the flow is normal. You have to have the right flow. The reason why. You might think there are instances where when you have calculi, you would want to just, you will think that removing the stone is going to keep your urinary tract normal. There are so many instances, even after removing the obstruction, your flow is not normal. That again, so most of the times, it does the first goal when you do automatically, the second Second thing is achieved. But there are instances where it, the obstruction happens because there is already a stricture there. Okay, Left alone, if the stricture was not there, your calculus would have just floated out. So you need to keep in mind that there can be an anatomical variation happening in the track. So when the, because you're not following this patient, he comes to you. So on that day, you take an X-ray, you do an ultrasound, you know that there is an obstruction, you would directly go for an intervention. But intervention alone should not be the goal. You should also try to reestablish and check that there is no, there is normal flow of urine through the tract. Now, so coming to the surgical techniques, what are the surgical techniques we do? or lower urinary tract. The common things, everybody does this day in, day out. So it is just a cystotomy for the bladder, and of course, urethrotomy. You might do a prescrotal urethrotomy or a perineal urethrotomy, as the case may uh, indicate. So these are the two techniques that we do. Now, I would walk you through certain scenarios. So each one of us react in a different way. Here, people get more wiser over the years, right? So as a surgeon, young surgeon, I would want to cut and stitch when I get an opportunity. 
and how to do it, whether to do, see the, the, the wiseness doesn't exist during that first 10 years of your surgeon's life. So my, my mentor, Dr. JP, most of the surgeons, it is a saying, first 10, 10 years, first decade of your life, you would want to cut and stitch. You get a chance, you would want to cut and stitch. You have a highest drive to do that. Second 10 years, you would want to just stick on to or specialize in to something. And third decade, you would suggest against surgery. So you become more wiser, you, are, you become more uh, understanding. You know that you can articulate that particular tight junction with something else, not only surgery. So that is the wiseness. So what I'm trying to tell you is, each one of us, we have a big uh, population here, young surgeons, very senior surgeons with 40 plus experience here. So it is, this is not to them, it is to the other group here that different scenarios. So this is a case, this is a, a retriever, six years, male neutered, and he has got strange urea, I think. It has got strange urea, intermittent hematuria for the past eight hours. I'm talking hours. And uh, the x-rays, you can see. Can you see? Do you see anything there in the bladder? No. And you see these stones here on the pelvic urethra. I mean, in the penile urethra, nothing or anywhere. So your ultrasound was negative for any cystic alkali. Uh, no significance, your chemistries and your CBC were insignificant, nothing remarkable. Electrolytes, everything was okay. Now, what is your plan? We are going to discuss just this. What is your plan here? Okay. Eurohydro, retropulsion. Then? So as a surgeon, you would go with plan A, be a military person. I have a good plan. Okay, on the merit of this case, this is very easy. You can go do retrohydropulsion, right? Okay, if you go with that mindset, you prepare, you try doing it. If you're successful, happy. What not if that fails? If it fails, if you're not able to push that in, you will do urethrotomy. So go with this plan. So you're going to have urethrotomy. You will try to do retro urohydropulsion. If it's positive, we are happy. If it fails, you go for urethrotomy, right? So now, Dexter, five years. Now he has a single stone. Do you see the stone here? Nothing there in the bladder. He is five years, right? It's a boxer, five years, one stone, and strange urea with intermittent hematuria for past 24 hours, single urethral calculi, no cystic calculi. All other things are normal. Now, what is your plan? What is your plan? Yes, retropulsion. It is the same thing. First thing, the easiest thing, easy. Sorry, you retropulse, then what do you do? Hmm? Cystotomy. How many cystotomies? I don't want from the... <laughs> cystotomy. Okay, then, if you don't want to do cystotomy, what else? Huh? One stone. This patient is five years. You have one stone, no cystic alkali, got only one stone. You, what is your decision making here? Okay, we are going with retrohydropulsion. Then, do you want to take this patient through surgery for cystotomy? Huh? 
you want to follow monitor okay right okay now this if you are not okay that what are the surgical techniques as previously we spoke urethrotomy retrohydropulsion and cystotomy right now retrohydropulsion and management of the three most of us sometimes if you are in that first decade your thrill will be to go to a cystotomy if you successful you are able to push that you will try to do cystotomy right it is not wrong it depends on so many factors if the client understands the client wants you to go get that bloody stone out of this dog if it suggests you go and do it it is money for us but ethically speaking retrohydropulsion if you are successful you would automatically wait and try to manage and monitor till such point because why did i tell you about those factors which we are talking about there are certain stones this stone is radio opaque so what are the radio opaque this is i'll go back you can see that radio opacity this stone is radio opaque significantly radio opaque so it's got it's just singular so you should think what are the possibilities that this dog could have got what are the stones right okay calcium silica then stoid also so so you have to think then this gives you this direction okay so that is why i have just tried to push this so medical management in case if you are not able to push that then you automatically go have you have no other choice but you go for urethrotomy now this one money 13 years male strangeuria with intermittent hematuria for past 4 days and the previous history of urethral obstruction and surgical intervention now multiple you find multiple urethral calculi here all lined up and uh, cystic calculi you have a prosthetic calculi also there so all other things are all normal okay so what is our plan here they the step 1 is what i am trying trying to tell you we need to have something some systematic approach this is a patient is with us we take a call tonight we need to fix this case right what will be your first choice retrohydropulsion okay then ah ah you will go for, if retropulsion is not possible you will go for uh, urethrotomy as well as cystotomy okay yeah. here biology we cannot tell not at all possible i i i i fail i i lost one of my other photographs wherein you will find this entire bladder with the full uh, except this part fully filled with stones this tract entirely covered with stones throughout the entire urinary tract calcuary mari i lost that uh, thing i wanted to put that now so wh what is the decision making here so as you said urethrotomy right so always retrohydropulsion should be attempted and then if you fail there urethrotomy try to remove and then try to go and do a cystotomy okay right and management as uh, dr jairaj had said management right so anti grade hydro preparation depends on the size of your uh, stones if it is too small anti grade hydro propulsion retrograde is going down to the top anti grade is you are coming from top to bottom that can be medically done or you can go do a flushing these things can be attempted on patients where you find very very small stones there has there is variability in that stone this can be seen in uh, even in urates but in silicates because they have the jacked uh, it is very difficult though you have smaller stones uh, 
So that can be attempted, medically can be given. So what is that plan B do we have for this patient? Now, in all these three things, the answers came from only, you try to see only the x-ray, you try to see only the uh, technique, all the three techniques, there are only three techniques. You try to hydropulse, or do erythrotomy, or cystotomy. All the answers came from only seeing the x-rays, ultrasound, or whatever it is. But you people did not think beyond that, okay? Now, the important thing here is, that's age. There are so many factors you need to consider. So, how do we pick the right surgical intervention? Now, breed, breed is important. There are certain susceptibilities happening in certain breeds. Examples, at least one common breed which we see, Dalmatians, yeah, age, does age has a significance on this? Middle age, three to six years, okay. Neuter status does have. Testosterone androgen dependency happens in certain uh, uh, calculi, especially dashes, 16. Then your dietary details, physical and metabolic disorders. Say physical and metabolic disorders, you have to talk, you have to have. Think about it. See, certain stones are from especially your calcium, hypercalcuria can come from so many. This patient with you, he has already gone through this course of surgery. So you need to give him a foolproof. So the owner at 13 years, the dog is okay to surgery, but the same thing records again. It's going to recur. He's come back to you only after recurrence, so he's going to recur. So you need to fix this patient once for all, right? So owner compliance is important. He may not. The first thing he does is he was looking for a complete a technique where he's not going to come back to you after for this particular problem. Then anticipated type of calculi, depends on as we discussed. And position and numerosity of your calculi. Here, position. Position is throughout, literally throughout. Forecast for comorbidity in the future. That is important. You forecast. 
13 years, another six months, you can go have a cardiac problem, it can have a, a renal disease, that time is not uh, okay for a surgery. So today you have a time, your time, your pre-operative risk assessment is perfect. So if you're going to do a technique, what is the technique that you want to do? What technique would you want to attempt? Huh? Euthanize, huh? Euthanasia is simple. We have euthanized. I am not telling. This is, we have euthanized. There are uh, incorrigible clients who would come and say, okay, doctor, I have already done twice. I have done this year. I have done there. I cannot. I cannot give you your prescription diets. It is very costly. I cannot manage. I have this problem. I have that problem. So, what is that technique we will do? That is one. That is the question we are going to follow and understanding the conditions that favor the uroliths. These things, this, this is very important, okay? Only when you understand how these things happen, you can actually decide on the course of your action, surgical action. So, <coughs> so for money, what do we do? We do scrotal urethrostomy, right? So, what is scrotal erythrostomy? It is a permanent, it's, a, it's not a temporary ostomy, it's a permanent uh, uh, diversion of this urethral tract, okay? This involves, one, your orchidectomy and scrotal ablation. How many of us have attempted or uh, considering similar cases, like money? I know this group, I know this group. I will not consider this. <laughs> yeah, that is very good. So that is very, very important. Now, scrotal erythrostomy, we attempt to do this in recurrent urethral and cystic calculi, in geriatric patients with extensile uh, urethral and cystic calculi, urethral strictures, penile trauma, fracture of ospinus, and neoplasia of the penis. Now, this is just a... Uh, I don't think this is required to just give you an understanding of how things are here. Now, this slide is important. <coughs> now, the scrotum is somewhere here, right? And our point of interest is this is going horizontally and it starts going up dorsally. So, our point of interest is in this section here. Now, when you go and section that, this is C. If you see, you have the urethra. The urethra is more superficial there at that point, and it has uh, a retractor penis muscle, a single retractor penis muscle going beneath that, and you have the urethra. The urethra is covered by spongiosum, corpus spongiosum, a thin layer of corpus spongiosum. The entire thing lays on the penile body, which is covered by tunica albuginea. We see it seen as some whitish sheath. We'll see that shortly. So because of this convenience that here, you can easily open up and do the ostomy, right? Anybody can do that, right? So this is the point of our interest. So the common things here are your blade number 10, to do your scrotal ablation and your orchidectomy. 11, you use to do the first part of the urethrotomy. Then you have the hemostatic forceps, and some mom, gelpi. This thing, the urethrotomy scissor, this scissor will be very useful in your practice. So a straight urethrotomy scissor is very good. Needle holders and the suture material. For the ostomy, we use a monofilament polydiaxonone suture material size 4.0, can be even less than that, 5.0 also can be used on smaller patients. It depends, right? So, and uh, urinary catheter is important. Now, this is a standard, use standard dorsal uh, positioning and uh, preparation for sc uh, scrotal ablation and uh, this. The first part is to do this orchidectomy. 
So you go do a parscrotal, do a circum, <coughs> do an in incision around the uh, scrotum, and then open it up, do an orchidectomy. It can be either open or it can be closed, uh, your wish. Now once the, uh, the scrotal ablation is done, we go to clear the fat there and try to go and identify the first. This is the first exercise you do. Identification of your retractor penis muscle, okay? So once you clear the fat around, you will start. So you will, once you clear the fat, once you clear the fat, you will try to first hold the penis. Through this incision, you try to hold the penis with your non-dominant hand. Try to pluck it up. Once you pluck it up, then when you see on the body, you find a muscle, a single muscle which grows. No. Okay, so that is retractor penis muscle. Your urethra is lying just underneath to the retractor penis muscle. So the first thing is once you pick it up, now the second thing you do, once you identify, you try to isolate and put this out. So we try to undermine. You lift it, you start undermining and bluntly dissecting. Hold, don't try to crush this muscle. You can use a back or towel clamp or an, a tissues forceps, Alice tissues forceps. You don't try to crush, but go around it, pull it, keep it aside so that you will, your urethra is more visible. How does the urethra look? You will find it as a purplish track. So, so you, once you expose the penile urethra, can you see this? The penile urethra here, you try to just bluntly dissect, reflect it, and you will be able to see this as a purplish urethra there. You make a small incision there and extend this incision. Now, the second important thing is doing this urethrotomy. Most often, I have seen people doing urethrotomies and uh, they come to us after a few months or few, within a few weeks because the urethrostomy, ostomy site is very small. So here, don't forget to have a minimum of four centimeter. Your urethrostomy should be four centimeter. So you have to do a four centimeter urethrotomy. Okay, so that is what is being done. Now the urethrotomy, you pick it up, stabilize, make a first puncture, exactly. Use your urethrotomy scissors to extend. Now the caudal extension should go up till the point where this takes off dorsally. That is what I showed you on that first slide, okay? So the incision should be more towards, the caudal incision towards, more towards the point where it starts going up, right? And you should be, if you are able, if you are okay, you are successful in putting a catheter inside, you will be able to find the catheter which you have reamed it in previously. If you didn't, you will probably see the calculi. Calculi will be your only landmark on the urethra, right? So after that, clearing the calculi, you can go put the catheter in for us to go and work further, right? So four centimeters, don't forget your urethrotomy length should be four centimeters. Anything less than that, your stoma will start to shrink and it will come back with a stricture. So you try to measure that. Now, this is the final thing. This is where completion of erythrostomy. Now, when you examine the edges, from the inner side to outside, inner side you will have the urethelium, the urethra, and 
Next, you will have a thin layer of corpus spongiosum. So that is the major thing. So outer side, you have the tunica albuginea. Now, this is, this is the urethra edge, and this is the corpus spongiosum, and this white tissue here, that is your tunica albuginea. It has a lot of what? What does it have? Collagen. It's very tough. When you drive this, you, have, you will find that it is going very tough. So forget, don't forget these three important landmarks. Now, the suturing starts like this, OK? There are three point, three point closure. First bite is through the urethra. You drive it through urethra. You don't try to go and separate the spongiosum. It is so adherent. Try to drive it through, take it out, and then the next bite will be on the tunica albuginea here, tunica albuginea, and the third one will be a split thickness bite on the edge of the skin, okay? So split thickness, can you see how it is split here? It is not through and through, it goes through the middle part of the skin. Now, this is what I try to show you here, and this is the dermis, and this is the epidermis. Your needle will drive through this. You come out like that, right? The reason why you do try to do that is only then your edge of your uh, urethra will come flush with the skin edge. Otherwise, you will go take it through and through. You're going to roll this skin over it, and the healing takes a longer time, right? There is a mistake in this slide. So this is through and through. You take the bite here, this is through and through. You don't take it like that. You'll have to take it and come out through the edge. OK? So before doing this, we try to go and do a four-point fixation to stabilize the stomach. So we have done the erythrostomy, you mean erythrotomy. Now you try to fix at four points. First, do fix this at four points. So you have uh, long, two long edges to close. Those two long edges also, you can run a continuous suture pattern using, not to forget, to take the bite on the tunic albuginea. That is the fulcrum which holds both the edges together. With the, if you don't take the bite, the suture pass through the urethra is going to come out. It will tear through. So you will not have an ostomy. Okay. Osteotomy, completion, you will find it looks really wired here. Don't bother about all your cosmetic appearance. You see this, this is on the 14th day. Now we are using an absorbable suture. It starts falling around, so don't bother. After a month, this will look so natural, right? So there is no cosmetic uh, uh, feel that you should have once you perform or you finish your surgery on that particular day, right? So we will then have to, once you have done this, you have to go do a patency test, check whether the entire urethra is fully patent, right, till the bladder. So we will just go through one. This is the entire procedure. It's just a two-minute video. So you are going through a scrotal incision. The idea of showing this video is to understand and appreciate what, how the spongiosum bleeds. So you do the orchidectomy. Ah, here, here you can see the retractor penis muscle. We will elevate the retractor penis muscle. Then bluntly, you can start doing it. You have now clamped and pulled this up outside. Now you are able to see the urethra well, the purplish tint you will have. Make a small puncture. 
extend it both ways. You will encounter, this is a bloody surgery. You cannot, you have to be mentally prepared. But when, when your assistant or yourself, when you're holding it tight, you can reduce uh, bleeding to a certain extent. We use a poly PDS 4.0. So four points you fix. This is the first bite. Now we are taking a, a split thickness. You can you can watch on the skin. It doesn't come out. Okay, when this was pulled, the entire pressure is held only by your tunic albuginia. If you don't take the bite in Tulika albuginia, when you tighten, your suture will cut through the urethra. And how many, and I'll come back after this. So with every bite through every pass, especially through the urethra, because you have the spongiosum, you will have encounter a bleed. This is not a life-threatening bleeding at all. Then you start doing the continuous. You will follow entire, whether you put interrupted or whether you run a continuous, you are going to ensure the three-point fixation throughout your stomach. <clears throat> And the number of throws with PDS, how many throws? A minimum of uh, six throws, anything less than that, five or six throws, anything less than that, this suture material is going to pop out. So six throws, five to six throws is important. You can see the edge. The advantage of using a monofilament absorbable is you may not go and meddle. There is no reason for you to go and remove the sutures. Once it is absorbed, it falls apart and the system heals so fast. You can also use uh, uh, monocryl 5.0 or 4.0. You see the bite on the tunica albuginia? Once the sutures are laid, the bleeding gets arrested. There is no need for you to have an indwelling catheter of that, this surgery. The only thing you will be doing is to just go flush you can use normal saline to just flush. You might have a few blood clots lingering to the ostomy site uh, along the edges. So use a low flow with a syringe uh, and uh, a 20 ml syringe and a 20 gauge needle. Slow flow, not to very much disturb the uh, closure, right? You can use uh, the cranial side. You may not have. You may not. Have, you may have to use some interrupted sutures to just approximate the skin, like this. Try to always, when you run uh, interrupted, try to place the suture on either side, not on the incision line. Hey, 
Okay. Now, recapitulation. I just a scrotal incision followed by amplification of a retractor penis muscle, exposure of your penile urethra, four centimeters urethrotomy is something important. Ensure your caudal incision runs till the point where it goes, goes up, right? Because only when it goes up, your stones which are floating down, are they're going to get dumped directly downwards. That's the reason we try to go in, extend more caudally, right? And uh, three-point suturing is the essence of closure for the ostomy. If you miss here, you fail. And fixation at four corners of ostomy with the interrupted pattern, then along the edges, you can do continuous. Doing a running a continuous is easy. It arrests bleeding post-op. And suture material, polydioxanone. And uh, an eight to 10 French uh, catheter to ensure patency. You need not have the, you will never have leave a catheter inside, right? So to sum up, take home message, when you're deciding on the outcome, on the intervention, please look at the breed, your age, neuter status. This, these things are important. Your dietary details, physical metabolic disturbances, recurrence, owner compliance, anticipated type of calculi, position, numerosity of the calculi, and the forecast for comorbidity in the future. So, yeah, and understanding the conditions that favor lids. Okay, thank you. This one? So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Venkatesh. So we have come to the end of the session. And like yesterday, cocktails will be here. And in the restaurant, the dinner will be served. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, uh, because uh, he was pressing for time. I wanted to continue on that. What is the, am I audible? What is the downside? to the erythrostomy and your management. Erythrostomy management we have done today. Now how are you going to manage this patient over the years? Now, what is the difference between a UTI, urinary tract infection in a male and in a female? In female, the bladder is more proximal to the exterior. It is shortest. So there is always a tendency for uh, cystitis, bacterial cystitis happening in females. That's why you have uh, more number of stuoids happening in the female. But in the male, it is not the stuoid, it's not the infection as such, it is the primary cause for a calculi is different. It can be silicate, it can be anything else. And secondary, because of the damage it does and uh, a compromise happens in the barrier of the bladder, you have opportunistic infections happening. And that can escalate and form a stu white stone in a male. So females, mostly you would find solitary stones, big stones, because of unabated uh, bacterial infection going on. So you have a big clot that gets sediment. Now, considering this, when you finish with your urethrostomy, you talk to your client, you have to keep regularly following it up with a what? Urinary? You'll have to do a culture. You keep doing this culture because it has a tendency to develop uh, cystitis because of this procedure, right? You have now brought down an easy access there. So that is one reason. That is the only downside there. So you keep doing it. So otherwise, it's fine, right? Spillage, there is no spillage. We are not working in a... You have the wall to tight your trigone. You're not working near the trigone. Trigone is there. Once you finish, I wanted to have a video here how this dog pees. This dog will not lift his leg and pee. Yeah, it starts to squat even from the day two post-op. It starts to squat and pee. The one is first is 
first priming thing is the pain, urethral pain. Though you try to cover it up with pain, the post-op, it starts squatting. So that is not at all a problem. There is no urinary incontinence. A tendency. Yeah. That, that, you know, yeah, that is there. Dr. Jairaj was asking about the influence of orchidectomy. Once you, any orchidectomy post-neuter, there is a, a fall in the urethral sphincter mechanism. The, the uh, priming is gone, so the muscles become more weak. That is incontinence. Can happen with neuter. So that's what he's asking. Yeah, that can happen. That can be managed in a medical way. But... Older dog. Perineal urethrotomy. No, 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 no. Perineal. Perineal instead of a perineal urethrotomy. Sir, Mike, Mike. No, no. Dr. Jairaj is asking. We are going and doing an orchidectomy, does this orchidectomy, orchidectomy is going to affect, has an effect on the neuter. The, once you do it, it affects the urethra. Okay, so there can be a urethral post-neuter, urethral incontinence. So if the incontinence happens, does it happen, does it affect, that is your question. Yes, it can happen. Now this case, the case which I discussed here was on a 13-year-old. And I don't find a reason how this is going to be of a, a, a major effect there at 13 years, right? But if the same thing was possibly done because of a trauma or a, because of a tumor or a stricture, you go and perform this, yes, it can happen. And you need to go take a recourse on a medical uh, management. Medical management with testosterone, right? Only that can be possible. But the downside to this is, if you do not educate the client on a, a susceptibility to bacterial cystitis post-op, that is very wrong. That's not ethical. You, it's our responsibility to tell that he has to come back to at least uh, once in three months, at least at once in two months to do a urethral, I mean, to do a urine culture, right? So anything else? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vengitesh. Uh, again, I'm announcing tomorrow the session starts by 9 a.m. with Dr. Sri Devi on approaches to reducing neonatal mortality in dogs. Uh, I request you all, you have to vacate the rooms. You can even vacate the rooms, keep your luggages in your car, or you can keep it in the reception, and then you can attend the classes. And then the third thing, the feedback forms will be there with the files. Please fill it up, hand it over and then get your certificates, and there are surprise gifts also of fighting. Thank you, thank you. Now, the cocktail will be here, and the dinner that, is, uh, that will be served in the restaurant. Thank you. <laughs>